lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, August is almost done, and that means that we are almost done mentally, I think, in terms of getting out in the garden with the same kind of gusto that we did, of course, at the beginning of the season. It's just not happening. Not only that, but the kids are going back to school soon, if they haven't already, and it's a crazy, crazy time of year. So I want to give you a tip on something that I do in in my gardens that really helps me uh, in terms of editing and planning for how I want to manage my beds, especially this time of year. And I always chuckle because when it's winter, I wish I would have taken more of these types of photos. And right now in August, it's really hard to get myself out in the garden and do the things that I know I need to do, such as taking this particular type of photo. And what I'm talking about is going around the garden and taking a wide angle shot of each of the beds around the house. Each of the locations where I've got containers or actual beds or raised beds, what have you, so that when I get back in the house, I can put them on my iPad Pro and begin to edit those pictures. And I love to use Sketch to do that. So what I do is I'll upload those photos and with my, the pencil, the Apple pencil that came with my iPad Pro, I can start to mark on those photos things that when you're standing in front of your garden and it's right in front of you, it seems like I just sometimes can't picture or imagine what I want to do in that bed next. But when I have the picture on my iPad and the editing pen in my hand, it becomes so much more clear to me because I can see the dead spots or the spots that are just not life-giving to me anymore. And that's when I really start to work on my planning for how I want those beds to look next year or even things that I need to do yet this fall to get those plans in place. So I'll start looking at things like what in particular is not working. And I'll usually just begin by circling those areas. And then when I'm out there with my student gardeners or by myself, I'll know this is the particular area that we need to start removing plant material in or begin dividing things, thinning things out, what have you. Somehow just having that wide angle picture on the iPad with some type of editing tool or software, whatever you like to use, it just seems to make it so much more clear what needs to happen next. So there's my tip for you on editing your August garden. I also want to remind you that coming up this month are a couple of shows that I'd like you to do a little bit of prep for just so that you can maximize your enjoyment. Uh, The first is we're going to be doing a spring bulb ordering party kind of online with three special guests, and then two representatives from bulb companies. So in order to prepare for this, go to the Color Blends website and order their latest catalog, and then go to the Van England website and order their latest catalog. And then that way, when we're talking about these bulbs, you'll have the catalogs right in front of you and you can go through them with us uh, and you'll be right in sync and also place your order. The next thing is I have Marta McDowell joining me on the show later this year, and she's the author of All the President's Gardens. I love this book. She's a garden historian, which is a fantastic blend, I think, of interests. And this book covers the 18 acres that surround the White House, which I think is just amazing because we went to Washington, D.C. last summer on a vacation, and I would have never guessed that there's that much property around the White House. But it's a fantastic book. It's a beautiful book. I love the cover. It's on a on a shelf in my office here that where I can always look at it because it's kind of propped up. But it's it's beautiful. And I'm doing an online book club event uh, for this book in addition to a book club 
uh, in-person event if you live in the Twin Cities and want to join. So uh, check that book out. Start reading. Uh, I think the book club will wrap up at the end of September. We're going to launch it uh, September 1st here. So grab that book, start reading along with us. And then if you're interested in joining uh, the virtual book club, just go to the Facebook group for the Still Growing Podcast. And how you'll find that is go to Facebook and then search the term Still Growing Podcast Group. That's the Still Growing community of listeners and guests. And you just click that, make sure you're in the tab that says group, because that's what you're looking for, and then just ask to join. It's a private group. Um, I'll admit you once I make sure you're not a spammer and that you are uh, like a real person. And it's a great place, not only to say that you're interested in being part of this online book club of all the president's gardens, but also to share your own garden stories, interact with some of the great guests that are on Still Growing, and connect with other listeners of the show. And the other great thing about it is it is the place where I post all of the listener giveaways from my guests and my sponsors. So if that's something that interests you, make sure that you get to that Facebook group. So go ahead, check it out. And I would love to meet you there on the Still Growing Facebook group on uh, Facebook. Well, the signs that fall is fast approaching are all around us from the shorter days to the colder weather. I know this past week, right before the weekend hit, we got a little cold snap. So it's coming. Uh, And the sumac has started to change. The sumac is changing. So that always puts me in the mood for some fall soups. And I wanted to make sure that I shared with you this really awesome, easy chicken tortilla soup recipe. I'm going to put it on my blog. It'll be in the Facebook group for sure. So check it out there. But it's from Lauren's Latest. That's the blog and it's her easy chicken tortilla soup. Oh my gosh, you guys, you've got to try it. Add it to your list of things to make, especially this month of September. It'd be a great thing to have on the stove when the kids get home from school. Now, the last little thing I wanted to share with you is an article that fellow garden blogger Lauren Lindsay had shared on her Facebook page, and it was featured in the Houston Chronicle uh, this past week. It was written by three gals uh, for the Houston Chronicle, and it was all about the benefits of native plants, especially when it comes to flooding. And they were specifically addressing the tax day flood that had happened in the Houston area and that uh, this flooding had led to talks about landscape and hardscape improvements to try to help make that area less susceptible to flooding. Now, this was a brief article, but it was another great reminder of one of the important benefits of native plants that, number one, they can withstand the flooding, and number two, they can really help handle flooding if you're in an area where that occurs. So check that out. I'll have that on the website as well. Okay, so now I want to introduce you to today's guest. It's Beth Billstrom of morethanoregano.com. She's a fantastic garden photographer and she blogs at More Than Oregano. And I have the most memorable story of meeting Beth. And that is, we were both at the Macy's Flower Show Preview in downtown Minneapolis. And it was a special event for garden bloggers. And Beth was there and I was there and I'd brought my daughter, Emma. And Emma and I are both standing there We're in this reception room, and I see Beth. She's got her camera bag. She looks completely, you know, professional. And I basically kidnapped her. I grabbed her. I said, oh, my gosh, come over here. Tell us everything you're doing. How are you doing it? Can you talk to my daughter about what it's like to be a garden photographer? And Beth was so gracious, and she did just that. She actually opened up her camera bag and took us through all of her lenses and all of the equipment that she uses and kind of gave us a little mini tour about what it's like to be a garden photographer. It was so inspiring to my daughter, Emma. Now, she didn't have to do that, but that's just how nice she is. And then she happened to mention that she was going to the Garden Bloggers Fling later that summer. And so that was another point of connection for us. And we stayed in touch over the next couple of months. And eventually we decided we were going to do this show together. So I invited her to be a guest and it took us three times, I kid you not, of chatting to put the interview together. 
together. The first time I had to cut it short, I was getting the kids from basketball. The second time, I think my tape ran out. And then finally, the next day, we were able to wrap things up. But the wonderful thing about this show is that Beth and I became friends. So that's my favorite part about this show is that you'll hear us start to laugh and connect. And I will forever remember this show as the show where I actually made a friend just recording an episode. Well, hi there, Beth. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm doing great. Well, I think you and I talked a little bit in the uh, pre-chat here that I just came in from cleaning up my yard because we had a huge storm blow through uh, Maple Grove. Yes. Wasn't that just crazy? Yes. And my mom and I had just talked that we were due for a good storm. We haven't had a good storm in so long. Now, we both live in what would be considered suburbs of Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I'm up in a northwest suburb in lovely Maple Grove, and you are, you're close. Where are you at in the city? I am in Waconia. So we're about 30 miles west of Minneapolis. Okay. Well, I was so excited to get a chance to interview you today because we met actually at the Macy's Flower Show this spring in downtown Minneapolis. We did. And mm-hmm. I know that we're both going to be at the Garden Bloggers Fling later this month. We so. are. Mm-hmm. Are you super excited about that? Oh, my I gosh. cannot wait. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, well, and by the time this episode airs, uh, we're talking now, it's like the second week in July, but by the time this episode airs, we may have already gone and had such a fabulous time. Um, But I am really, really looking forward to it uh, because it'll be the first time that I get to go. And of course, the fling is an opportunity for garden bloggers from all over the United States to get together. Right. And then I thought it would actually be kind of fun to have um, kind of a post uh, garden blogger fling podcast where we maybe chat with a few oh, other ladies. Oh, what talk a about, great idea. Yeah, uh-huh. we can talk about what we went through and what we liked and some of the highlights. So if you want to be part oh, of that. I would love to be part of that. I would absolutely love to be part of that. I've been watching, um, you know, I've been getting these uh, Facebook posts and things regarding what we're going to be seeing. And my excitement is just increasing and increasing. Some of the gardens I have seen, the public ones, but there's a number of them that I've only heard about. And so I'm very excited about this event coming up. Event yeah. coming up. It's obvious they've put a lot of thought into where they're bringing all the garden bloggers. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, well, why don't we start by having you share a little bit about your personal life, and then we'll jump into some of the things we both love, <laughs> which are gardening, writing, blogging, photography, and so on. All right. That sounds good. I have been in Minnesota for the past uh, 17 years, and uh, we've raised our family here. I'm uh, married to a wonderful man, and we've been married for many years, and we have three boys, and our oldest uh, is now living in Colorado. We have uh, another one that is in college and another one about to head off uh, to college as well. So it makes for great traveling, great garden exploration. We love music. My husband and I spend a lot of time in different musical venues around uh, Minnesota. We we have a boat. We love the lake life. We're just uh, generally people who are um, active. Very active. Now, where did your boys go to college or where are they going to college? Our oldest two went to um, North Dakota State University in okay. Fargo. Uh, so Jake graduated just this past May. Joe is there, and he will be there another couple of years. And then our youngest is headed to Purdue. Oh, Purdue. So we've been, yep. So we've been going back and forth to uh, Purdue. It's a wonderful community, and actually, there are a lot of Purdue alumni right here within the Twin Cities. We just got invited to a barbecue that they're going to be having. Having so that's always nice. Um, so yeah, it's just a very busy time of you know people just. Uh, Kids just going, uh, living their dreams, starting out their dreams, uh, Mark and I continuing our dreams, and it's just uh, really a very um, fun and um, active time in our lives right now. Hmm. It's funny you say the thing about the Purdue alumni. I know a woman here in Maple Grove that's a Purdue alumni. I'll have to put you in contact oh, with her. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and she's lovely, so you'll like her. Well, um one of the first things that you mentioned when I met you was that you were moving more and more into the photography space because you started out as a blog, as a blogger, and mm-hmm. now you're really taking up this whole passion around photography and you are 
going to be releasing an on-site gallery, this aspect of your blog, where people can buy your fine art photography. And I'm so curious, what moved you to uh, get into photography? Well, photography has really been a part of my life ever since I was young. I still remember when I was 10 years old, my grandmother giving me my first Instamatic camera. Um, my uh, father used to work for Time Life magazine, and so we always had those big, huge photo books in our house, and um, mm. I have just really enjoyed photography for a very long time. And actually, the funny thing is, is that um, and on several occasions, I uh, had had my camera and was really moving towards starting more of a professional journey in photography and as you know life sometimes you know other priorities and things get in the way really you know my passion for photography has always been about inspiring and I think once I realized once it connected with me that I can take all this wonderful inspirational passion that I have for the garden and translate it into images that can inspire and uplift other people it just really kind of lit a fire and things just started really moving in that direction. What's in your camera bag, Beth? Give us a tour. What's what's in there? All right. Well, my camera bag initially started with a full format Canon 40D, and that was many years. But I loved it. I, I did really love it. But it was it's rather it's a large camera. It's a very large camera, and I'm not an incredibly large person. And so um, I worked with it and worked with it, and then. Uh, just recently, Canon came out with uh, the Rebel um, T6, and um, so I actually went into that. It's not a full-format camera, but it, the quality of the images and the quality of the lenses is very, very nice, and it was just really a great way to get me right back into it. Um, so that's uh, the body that I shoot with right now, although I also definitely have my I on the, the Canon Mark 5D, so uh, we'll be looking at that. So I shoot with that um, that body, and then I have a couple of zoom lenses. I have a macro lens, which is a 60 millimeter. Um, but my favorite artistic lenses are the Lens Baby um, kit uh, with the optics. Uh, that just really opens up the field for artistic interpretation of your subject. And so I'm having a lot of fun and a lot of enjoyment just exploring the world with that lens right now. Okay, now uh, you have to remember that there are people that have no idea what you just said. So what is, <laughs> <laughs> what is, and I'm in that camp, Beth. So what is the lens baby? Do I just go on Amazon? Because, you know, you can get everything from Amazon. But tell me, you what can is get- it? Lens Baby is a special manual focus lens. Um, they've been around for years. Um, and basically what it does is it, it helps you um, just, you shoot your subject, you capture your subject um, in different artistic ways. Um, there is a, what they call a sweet spot, which is where the little, uh, where you can get this really sharp focus and then the rest kind of blurs the image. You can distort the image. You can change the light on the image, but it's all done manually. So it's a very hands-on photographic experience. And it just gives you a look in your images that you really can't get even with some of the software that you manipulate, you know, your images with, kind of really develop your own style and your own voice. So if someone is really interested in a more creative, artistic sense of photography versus more of the scientific, trying to show like anatomically correct every part of a plant or things like that, if you're really more interested in a, in bringing out your own ideas and voice in a image, you would want to explore the lens baby. And so I have what's called the lens baby composer. So lens baby is kind of what Canon would be, you know, they're actually the company and then composer is the type of lens. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes Mm -hmm. complete sense. And your Mm -hmm. website is called more than oregano. And Mm -hmm. you started out as an herb gardener. You're still an herb gardener. Mm-hmm. Give me a virtual tour. Other than oregano, 
what are you growing for herbs? Because I know you're growing oregano, Beth. <laughs> I'm definitely growing oregano. In fact, I'm growing five different kinds of oregano. Oh my gosh. Um, now you have to tell I, us. You can't you can't give us that kind of tease. I just thought you were growing oregano. I did not no, know about uh, five kinds of oregano. Right. In fact, I do have a, a post on my blog for anyone who is um, interested in it. Of course, you can always use oregano for seasoning. Um, and that's basically how my website got its name. But then also, I I grow herbs for culinary purposes, for pollinator attracting purposes, and for fragrance. I just started exploring different varieties of oregano and said, uh, I hadn't heard of these before, but I'm growing Dittany. Um, it's actually the long name is Dittany of Crete. Um, and it is just a, a beautiful oregano that has so many different uses. I'm growing this one. It's called Kent Beauty. It's a beautiful um, flowering kind of trailing oregano. Again, if somebody wanted to go to my website, it is the first image on my landing page. That's Kent Beauty. Um, I'm also growing what's called Bob's Best. Um, There's a Turkish herb, uh, Turkish variety that I'm growing. And the last one that I'm growing is Hopley's, which is a very ornamental um, oregano. Again, if people want to find out more information or if you would like to see what they look like, uh, you can go to my website and just search oregano. And uh, I have a post that will just give more information about these. About all the five. About all five of them. Yep. Okay, perfect. I have this really unique planter or planter on my deck, and so they grow right on the top of it, and they kind of cascade down the edges. Um, and so my planter is, is like a raised pyramid. It has five levels to it, so that's what's growing at the top if you want, like, a visual tour. Yes. And then when you kind of go around the sides of it, I have different um, varieties of basil that I've grown from seed. I'm also growing stevia. Um, I'm growing chives, different ornamental peppers. Uh, I had been growing cilantro, but the ones um, that I was growing in that day have now bolted. They have gone to seed, so I have pulled those out, and I've replaced them with some other varieties of oregano, some chervil, some parsley, all of that. I have uh, French tarragon that if uh, you have never grown French tarragon in your herb garden, I would highly recommend it. It's a very flavorful herb on the savory side, so it's a great herb to um, season fish or chicken with. Um, Grilled chicken with tarragon, garlic, and a little bit of lemon is outstanding. That can be like the basis of your entire summer menus if you want it to be. There's so many things you can do with that simple recipe. Tarragon is supposed to be good for high blood pressure, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tarragon is really a wonderful herb. It's really fun to grow. It kind of, it gets its name from, um, it looks kind of like a serpent. So tarragon means little dragon. Mm-hmm. And um, so it kind of just, you know, squirrels all around there on, in your uh, container. You know, it's, a, it's another good one that's good for cascading or, you know, more of a free form type of, of herb. Um, I have a planter that I put that in with some lemongrass and another basil, and they're all growing together very well. They take full sun, um, you know, so they're really good herb partners in a container. Now, you mentioned growing basil from seed. I've never done that. I, I love basil. I, I buy it, uh, you know, started. I buy the Bonnie plants already started from the big yeah. box stores. And I Mm -hmm. usually buy a couple flats at a time. I'm not happy unless I have about 20 plants at all times. And that's good because basil loves company. So that's good. Yes. Now, (laughs) um, what's it like growing it from seed? How patient do you have to be? You don't have to be very patient. In fact, growing basil from seed is so easy. You could take even just, if you just wanted to grow it as like little microgreens, you could even take just like something, a little dish, kind of like a pie plate and put, um, you know, your soil in it, sprinkle your seeds over it, sprinkle a little more soil and keep it moist. They will pop up very quickly. And if you want to just use them as microgreens, then you can kind of just uh, snip those off, use them in whatever you want and just 
uh, replant. And that's a good way to keep basil growing over the winter. Um, because if you try to do a full basil plant, a lot of times over the winter, it gets kind of spindly and it'll just like shut down on you. Okay. Um, so that's a great method to try if you would like to have fresh basil over the winter. Hmm. I like that. And it's a great thing to do with the kids too. It's a great thing to do with the kids. And once you start growing basil, you now they in, in many of the garden centers are really offering a lot of different varieties, but just like anything that you grow from seed, um, you always have more choices available to you if you decide to grow from seed. So any of the large seed companies, if you go on their website, they'll have lots of different types of basil that you can try. Anything from lime basil to um, spicy basil, Asian basil, purple basil. I mean, there's just so many different varieties that are really fun to try. Um, and if you do enjoy that and want to put them in your containers or in your gardens, a lot of those types of basils, when they flower, they will also attract a lot of the different pollinators that you want in your garden. So the bees and even the hummingbirds, um, things like that, they'll attract. So it's really a great thing. Well, that's good. Now, when I use this plate method and I'm growing the basil, I'm going to call it my Beth basil. <laughs> <laughs> which might not be the same as holy basil but we know <laughs> but it's very close and I'm sure yeah. your husband would agree right it's very very close yeah. well listen I love to do that I'll get um I'll get a, a plant or something from somebody at a plant sale and All right. um, yeah and one of my first plants that I bought at a plant sale was from this sweet old lady named Doris and I bought her dahlias that she oh. so so loved and of course I said Doris what are these called? And she's like, I have no idea. And I said, well, they're my Doris Dahlias. So one of the first garden oh, tours, hilarious. it was, yeah, one of the first garden tours I was in, people were like, oh my gosh, those Dahlias, what are they? I said, well, those are Doris Dahlias. So so, <laughs> and now they're looking through all these catalogs saying, I cannot find a Doris Dahlia for the life of me. <laughs> Where did that woman get those Dahlias? So now I'm going to do the same thing with my basil. It'll be like, no, I, I started on a dinner plate and it's called Beth, <laughs> Beth Basil. <laughs> no, on a pie plate. A pie a plate. Pie? It needs a little bit of, yeah, it needs a little bit of depth. <laughs> All You'll right. be spraying and spraying it with water and saying, why won't these things grow? I can't get this to grow. I got to talk to Beth. I got to talk to my grower. What am I doing wrong? I got bad, bad basil here. Why <laughs> yes. won't it grow? Bad batch. Bad batch. <laughs> oh, honestly. Well, hey, speaking of, um, speaking of growers, where do you get your seed? Where do you like to get your seed? Okay, I uh, I like to get my seed um, from a number of places. I do use Johnny seeds. I use Renee seeds, uh, Renee Garden seeds. Yeah. Um, I do also. This is one of the lovely things about what I do is um, I do work with seed uh, growers and breeders, and so I do get to trial a lot of the new seeds that are coming out, and um, you know, and so that's really fun. So some of the you know, you might work with um, a bow, you know, horticulture or um, seeds by design. They don't, they don't um, provide seeds right to market. But if you go through Johnny's or Renee's or some of these other places, then you will get their seeds as it kind of goes down into the retail retail line. But um, but Johnny's is a good one. Like I said, Renee's is a good one. Those are your. Favorites. I have some burpee. Yeah, burpee seeds. I do use burpee seeds. Um, they have a great organic line of seeds that I really like. So do you have little pots all over your house or all over your uh, garden outside with, <laughs> with uh, herbs in them? I can't imagine that you're confining yourself to this one triangle planter. No, no, I'm not. In fact, during the the winter, like as we, winter goes into spring, um, it gets a little comical because, you know, someone from my family will open up a cupboard and there will be, you know, chives germinating because chives germinate better <laughs> in the dark, you know, so <laughs> chives will be germinating down there. Um, and of course, then I do have my growing station downstairs, which, you know, is always kind of funny to walk down there and see these lights and, and, and see all this like green plant matter growing and I'm just growing basil, you know, and, um, uh, 
in so, a pie plate, in a pie plate, <laughs> in a pie plate. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's as a home gardener, you just have to be pretty innovative. If there is a really good light source, and that's something that you can, when you buy seeds, um, you know, buy those seeds that have good directions on the back. I always try to tell people that because it'll tell you it, how it germinates best. Not all seeds germinate the same. And so some seeds need more light than others. Some seeds germinate best in dark, and then they want you to move it to the light. And so, you know, you have to, when you're growing indoors as a home gardener, you kind of just use those little innovative spaces. You know, my college sons will come home from school, and sometimes there'll be plants on their windowsills of their bedrooms. They'll be like, do I have to share my my <laughs> bedroom with the plant? This yes, you do. <laughs> You're like, honey, I know you can't close your shade, but just dress in the dark. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it. Well, um, speaking of herbs, you just had, uh, when I was looking at your website, uh, you had a post about chamomile. I've never grown it. Okay. True Mm -hmm. confession, haven't grown it. But you said there are four reasons that uh, people should grow chamomile. I'd love to hear you go through them. Oh, yes. Chamomile is great in the garden um, for a lot of different reasons. One Uh, If you live in a northern climate like we do, it still grows very easily and very well. It does sell seed, so I just want to let people know that, that um, if you start with a little patch, you will have a larger patch very quickly. But I use it, um, and that's why I posted these reasons, because I use it in a lot of different ways. So having a lot of it is, I think... um, you know, very good thing. I think that's that's a great thing. Um, but you can take the chamomile and you can actually strew it. That's kind of an old-fashioned word for just sprinkling it in your pet's bed, and it will alleviate fleas. It has a microbacterial type of component to it, and so that is just a natural method that you might want to use. You can also steep it as a tea leaves for five or ten minutes or so in hot boiling water and then cool that and then you can use that as a hair rinse and you do need to leave it on like if you want your hair to be lighter you leave it on a few more minutes and just kind of play around with that but if you use it several times it will actually you know lighten your hair you can also use it in the garden as a natural way to boost both your cabbage and your onions It just makes them more vigorous in their growth, and it uh, actually also helps to ward off um, some of the the bad pests and things like that. And then you can also make a very simple syrup out of it um, to kind of leave in a dish for the bees. And if you've never made um, a syrup with your herbs, it's just a basic recipe of two cups boiling water, um, add in two cups sugar, have it dissolve, and then turn the heat off of it. And then you can put the chamomile flowers in there and let it steep again for four to five minutes and um, just put it out there for the bees. There you go. Well, how interesting is that? Yeah. Kind of fun, huh? You know, and I just, I love that. I love just, you know, if you're going to grow an herb, especially in a small garden space, you don't necessarily have to grow you know, a lot of different herbs, but if you grow a few and then you know several different ways to use it, well, doesn't that make that fun? Yes, it does. Yep, absolutely. So you said it gets a little thuggish. It can get a little messy. Is it easy to pull or control if you need to go in there? It is. It is. Like mine um, grew up and then just, uh, just about two weeks ago, it was getting kind of unruly. And so I just cut it all back to about four inches And now it's growing up again. And so I'll have a second flush of flowers and things to work with. Oh, are you growing that from seed too then? I did grow from seed. Mm -hmm. All right. Another thing to order. It's on my list. (laughs) Well, um, what's one of the most, in your mind, Beth, what's one of the most terrible pieces of advice that's currently being implemented by gardeners these days? Do you have something that just drives you crazy? Well, I don't know if it drives me crazy or if it's just that I think this is a um, a newer, healthier way to work that maybe people just don't really know about yet. And that is 
um, don't be so quick to get out into your garden early and do that spring cleanup. I mean, that's something that we keep, you know, we have been told, you know, get all of that cleaned out before you plant, get out there, work that. Um, and really, you know, we're learning that um, your soil needs to be healthy as well and your soil needs to have nutrients. And a lot of the really good microorganisms and um, beneficial bugs, things like that, get washed in back into the soil from some of the decomposed things that you have left there over, you know, over the winter. So you want to give it, let your garden receive a few spring rains to wash those beneficial microorganisms back into the soil um, and then give your soil time to dry out before you get in there because otherwise you're just really compacting everything. Yes. So my thing is like when I hear people saying, oh, yeah, I can't wait to get out in my garden. I'm always like, well, just give it a second. You know, you don't yeah. have to be be the first one. That that kind of makes me, makes me crazy because I know. You know, I'm always anxious to get out there too, um, but maybe start with your containers. <laughs> yes. Give your garden a little. Give your garden a little time to do some, make some good soil soup. You know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. Well, I just had interviewed Robert Corrick, and he's written those books oh, okay. on um, understanding roots. And one of the things he said, it was very subtle, but it made me think uh, it's something I need to get because I don't have it, and that is a pitchfork. So oh, mm-hmm. when he's digging, he prefers to use a pitchfork because it's less compacting than mm-hmm. a whole big shovel going in there. And I thought, you know what? Didn't even think about it. Never, never gave that a second thought. The other thing that I did, let's see, it was last year toward the end of the year is I installed some paths in my garden. So oh, that, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, That's you know, great. We're, yeah, we're defining where we're walking and it's really helped, especially with the kids and the dog that they've got, you know, areas now where it's very clear. This is where we're walking. Um, so that was helpful. Do you have something like that in your garden? Do you have defined paths? I do. We put in little stepping stones just a few years ago. Uh, we also found these great, I tell you, a great place to go is when you, um, Go to some of your landscape supplier places and they might have leftovers of jobs that, you know, materials that they, that they were just left over from a large material. We picked up really inexpensively um, some of these, they're actually made of concrete, but they look like barnwood. Oh. And, uh, yeah. And so we actually made a little patio, a barbecue patio. We had enough of them. We made a small barbecue patio, like 12 by 12, right behind our garage right there. And then used them for stepping stones as well. So, and then on the other side, we used brick pavers and put stepping stones through like the tomato. I grow my tomatoes vertically. So uh, we we put it through that garden, and then along I have a big what's called a keyhole garden, kind of along that way through my raised beds, and that has been awesome. And so it doesn't have to be elaborate, but you know it doesn't have to be this elaborate, intricate type of brick paper thing. If you don't want to, you can make it just very simple, and it does the same thing, right? Absolutely. Now, yeah. are you an easily enchanted gardener or do you resist allowing your emotions to guide you in the garden? You know what? I used to be <laughs> very easily enchanted. I mean, I just was bringing home all the tropicals and if the flower caught my eye, I, you know, I would really just grab it. Um, but, you know, as you garden a little bit more, you do get a little wiser to that. And um, I'm more cautious now to do the research and see how well it will do in my garden. However, that said, I have to say, um, I still have that kind of enchantress side and in that it has to have something that pulls me in, you know, um, either a color or a texture or a fragrance. And that's probably something that I react to more emotionally. And I like to have that part, you know, add some excitement to the garden then I'll think, well, no, I'll take a pass on that. Does that make sense? Now, do you have a color? If I was going to entice you, what color would it have to be for you just to lose your mind and buy it? (laughs) Well, yesterday... For $6.94, I came home 
<laughs> with a passion flower vine. So there you go. <laughs> but what color? What color was the blue? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. It was purple. It was well, purple. <laughs> there you go. In honor of Prince in, in the state yes. of Minnesota, we're going with the purple. So you have a yes, weakness I, for the Viking purple, huh? Uh, well, you know, I I not no, it's really not attached to the Vikings at all. But I just thought about that because you were like, Well, do you have an emotional thing? Yes. Well, there I am. You know, I actually went for soil to because I, I was refilling my raised beds and they were having, you know, seventy five percent up. And here is this pat purple passion flower line. Talk about giving in. <laughs> I'm like, for six dollars, I can buy that even if it doesn't last. <laughs> yes, I know. Oh my gosh. I tell you, I had a phase. Uh well, I've been gardening for about 17 years as well. And you know, you have those phases where, you know, when you're learning to garden that yes. I don't know, you get a little snobby about some things. And I went through a you phase. <laughs> yeah, I went through a phase where I was like, oh, I can never have a daylily. They're everywhere. They're everywhere in Minnesota. That's just, you know, it's, it's shameful, you know, the yellow uh-huh. daylily. So I was like, no, no, no. And then and then I would go see people's gardens. And if there were too many annuals, I I scoffed at that. It was like, oh, well, anybody <laughs> can go buy annuals, you know. But um so what did I do today? I was, uh, you know, recovering from this storm and I've done this garden tour before. And I know that the week that this garden tour is happens to be kind of a lull week in the garden. The the early summer stuff has stopped blooming. And then the stuff that's supposed to be mm-hmm. blooming you know, for the back half of the season isn't ready yet. And for so sure. mm-hmm. I'm at Lowe's. I'm getting some new pruners. I'm getting some <laughs> and curse you, Lowe's, you have the, the clearance area. And they had um, the, the all their hanging pots were five bucks. I know. And you just, you know, you give in, you do, you definitely give in at that point. But you know, it's so funny that you talk about how we cycle through. And and I like when you say that we get a little snobby because honestly, (laughs) for a long time, I didn't use purple just for what you said. I'm like, Oh, you know, how predictable is, you know, I mean, Minnesota purple, but this year it is everywhere in my garden. I put in some of those, um, Bloomstruck hydrangeas and wow, they they call it purple. But boy, are they getting purple? Um, My pansies, I went crazy on the yellow (laughs) and purple pansies. Well, of course, I had a graduation too, and so our our school colors are um, gold and purple, and so you know that probably you know encouraged that. But it didn't take much, Um, (laughs) you know. And I, (laughs) you know, and the annuals. I have a place on my um, my porch is, is. is mostly shade and I have always kind of eh, you know struggled because shade gardening really wasn't my forte you know I'm more out in the sun and the big pollinator but this year my containers look great I used a lot of Coleus and um do you pronounce it Coleus or do you pronounce it Coleus how do you pronounce well that? I say Coleus but I've never heard this other saying and now that's going to stick with me it's like the first time I heard someone say Clematis and now I can't stop saying it <laughs> like great thank you <laughs> Thanks for giving me the obscure pronunciation Sorry. because now everybody can look at me like I don't know what to say. So what do you say again, Beth? Because I've never heard that before. No, I'm not going to repeat it because I don't want to give gardeners bad habits. No, no, no. You have to say it now. You have to. Everybody's like furiously rewinding. So you have to do it. You have to say it. Okay. I used to say coleus, but honestly, it's like that. It just doesn't really roll off your tongue very well, you know? So I say Coleus. I think it sounds just so much nicer. <laughs> what do you say? I say it. I say Coleus. Coleus. You know? Coleus. Doesn't that have more like of a French sound, don't uh, you think? <laughs> you know what? First of all, I absolutely love it because whenever I say Coleus, I always think of colonoscopy. Which I do too. I terrible. <laughs> terrible. So we're now, it's happening. It's happening right now. Calais. 
I love it. <laughs> I think we'll just reinvent gardening terminology <laughs> to make it just sound beautiful, don't you think? I because think so. there's such a poetic sense in the garden that I think it should sound beautiful <laughs> That's too. Right. And some of our, you know, yeah, some of our the names just, you know, don't roll off the tongue that easily. So but anyways, you know, back to annuals. Um, there's really <laughs> just some <laughs> Um, some lovely things out there, don't you think? And the begonias this year are really amazing. That's what I grew as well. I grew those from, you know, tubers. Have you ever grown begonias from tubers? Yes, I have. They are years did, ago. A hundred years. A hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. I did um, it. It's not hard. I mean, you put them in there in the spring. Put them in your containers in the spring. Just keep it watered, and that's really all you have to do. And those they just will pop up, and then, like you said, the reason what made me think of that is because the garden is looking kind of tired right yeah. now, mm-hmm. and if you you know obviously in the beginning of the season, you can go into your garden center and you they have all the you know the wax begonias or the other begonias right there. Um, but those will start to look a little tired by the end of the season. If you do them from tubers, then when the rest of the garden is looking a little weary, now they look very fresh. And I just put them in my front window box, and they're coming up with some, how do you pronounce it? Col- I say Calais. 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 <laughs> no, we're, we're going the other direction now. We are going with Calais. I love it. <laughs> and it, it is a, uh, a variety that is green and purple. So, you know, once you kind of start with the theme, I guess you just really keep going with it, huh? I, I, absolutely. Well, here's two words to fire you up a little bit, Beth. Cucumber mm-hmm. beetles. Uh, uh, cucumber beetles. You know, um, what do you do? What do you do with your cucumber beetles? You know what, what um, I think is the best thing for cucumber beetles and what I've heard about? And I used to, I, I feel bad, I used to get rid of these little things that love the cucumber beetles, and that's wolf spiders. Did you know that wolf spiders will prey on your cucumber beetle? I had no idea. So what do you do? Order I know. Them? You order them? Well, you know, you can do things. You know, I would like turn over my soil and there would be these little spiders coming out. And I used to think, ooh, you know, but actually they are, they're great. And um, you can, you can promote the wolf spiders coming by uh, having good soil. And actually, if you put straw down, that is also also makes a good um, hiding space or um, living space for wolf spiders. <laughs> wow! And do you grow cucumbers? I do grow cucumbers. This year, I'm growing two kinds of cucumbers. Actually, I'm growing them vertically. So um, I'm growing a salad more cucumber, and um, actually a it's a pick a bushel cucumber. They will actually grow upwards. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm excited about my cucumbers, and I'm really hoping that my cucumber beetles... I mean, I go out there um, at night, I'll just pick them right off. You know, you if I see them, yeah, yeah, I will I will pick them off. You know, my garden is small, so I can do that. I think people that have larger gardens probably, probably can't do that, so they have to do more things like, you know, rotating their crops or maybe using... Floating covers or, like I said, you know, the straw mulch that will um, slow the cucumber beetles down. And then also, you know, it's a great environment for your pests, your insects and stuff that feed on your cucumbers. But you have a bad problem with cucumber beetles? I don't. I'm not growing cucumbers anymore because the kids don't eat them that much. We don't eat them. And so I thought, you know what? I have to be done growing things for sport. I have to, I have to stop. <laughs> I have to stop growing things just because I'm a gardener and I know all gardeners grow these things. So uh, yes. this, this year I really honed in on what do I use and what are the kids like? And probably yes. our number one thing is pesto. We okay. love to make pesto. Yeah. Um, and, a, mm-hmm. and we went to a class, Emma and I did, with Jeff Sandino. He's a chef in town. He does a lot of okay. community ed classes. And uh-huh. he used to um, cook at Filio. Remember Filio in Uptown? It was this uh, restaurant that stayed open to like four in the morning or something insane. <sighs> So when you went to Mm -hmm. a late movie, you know, you could actually go out and and they had this fantastic banana dessert that was to die for. I think it was on fire. It was great. Really, really great. But this guy used to work there and a number of different high-end restaurants in town. And he has a fantastic pesto recipe that I fell in love with. And 
So I just I just make batches and batches and batches of pesto. Oh, we are a pesto family too. I mean, you can just not have enough basil and pine nuts and all yes. of that. And oh my so, gosh. Would, is there a secret or a special ingredient? Because I've always just you know made it with the olive oil and the basil and you know pine nuts. Terry Chaffer is up here in Maple Grove, and she has a store. Um, that used to be called the Oilery, but it's an olive oil bar. And now mm-hmm. she left that franchise. She started her own. It's called Love That Olive. I think she mm. sources it from the same spot. But she has a, her most popular olive oil is called Fior Fiori, I think. Okay. But it stands for mm-hmm. like a buttery olive oil. So that oh. is the olive oil that I get to make my, because then it doesn't taste, um, you know, there's like a bitterness to them. Yep, kind of heavy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. this one is light and very nice, very buttery, very kind of almost creamy. Oh, and uh, so I use that. We use pine nuts. We use a little bit of garlic, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. kosher salt. Put the we put the salt in last. Parmesan Reggiano. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. that sounds awesome. That's something that I want to explore more. Is the different types of oils. And just how they really bring out the flavors of this, your homegrown seasonings like that, you know, whether it's your basil or your thyme or tarragon, because you can, you know, infuse all of that in oils and really make some great dressings or like you said, pesto or use it in so many different ways. So. Yes. Add some lemon juice. I could do a whole show just on salad dressings because we love to make salad around here. Mm -hmm. I can do a big chopped salad, but really kind of, I separate all the ingredients out and then the kids pick what they want. PJ likes carrots. Emma doesn't like that. And, you know, so that is my favorite way to cook and prepare things over the summer is just, I mean, I love a recipe. I love a good recipe. I have a ton of recipe books. Obviously you use them a lot, but I think it's just, great when you have take some basic whole foods know what you like and kind of have an understanding of those flavors and you just kind of add add it together as you go and you know you don't really follow a recipe you're just making it to taste with what you like yeah. and it's fresh and it's seasonal and i just i love that about summer i think that is the best thing about having your own garden and the just the best way to prepare what you're going to make Fresh. I mean, of course, yeah, we preserve things, you know, if we have, um, you know, if we have more available. But I just think, you know, having your basics and just keeping to what you like, I love that. Yeah, I do too. I think the kids think I'm some type of garden magician. I've got my younger two, especially, <laughs> they have a very loose grip on where these plants are coming from. <laughs> You know, because I'm not growing all of them from seed. Obviously, I need to get my pie tin going. I'm going to go buy some pie tins after this interview, Beth. But um, <laughs> mine, will, mine will have an Oreo bottom first. I'll have to take that out of there. <laughs> then, then I will use them to plant seeds. In. But, um, <laughs> but the kids have this. Like, I don't know. They think I'm like I manufacture this in some way, and so. But they think it's fantastic. You know, I've taught them how to go out and harvest the basil and right. and harvest. Right. the lettuce and all that and they think it's they just think it's fantastic so. I, know. I know and then it's great to fill in with your farmer's market because I'm kind of like you after you garden for a, a little bit of time you realize what grows what you eat a lot of what you yeah. can kind of just you know get fresh somewhere else you don't have to grow everything I no. don't grow everything yeah. you know um, I love to grow tomatoes. I love to grow spicy peppers. Last year, I grew pumpkins, which was really fun to grow in a small space. I got yeah. some of those big Cinderella pumpkins, you even did? on my space. Yeah, you just have to, you know, I kind of, I took, well, one part of my yard kind of slopes down and, um, and, uh, you know, it was just always just difficult to keep grass and stuff growing there. So I said, you know, we were, we tore all the grass out. Um, you know, amended the soil, put compost and stuff. And I grew pumpkins there last year. Um, and it was just great. I just had to watch where the vines went, you know, make sure they didn't go crawling into my neighbor's yard or anything okay. like that. Um, but I got, you know, I got a good, nice, you know, little harvest and stuff of uh, some of the different kinds of pumpkins. And so that was fun. Now, this year we put vertical structures in that same place. And that's where I'm going to grow my tomatoes. And uh, so I started to grow cauliflower, but you know, that's, that takes up a lot of space and we don't really eat it that much. So I'm not doing that. And you know, you just kind of 
make the decisions based on what you like, right? Well, absolutely. And I was listening to this woman that's really into homesteading and uh, she's got a root cellar and she's got like this room devoted to canning and I would love to right. have it. Oh my gosh. You know, buy a house with a greenhouse. <laughs> I would just be like, oh. and here's my root cellar and, you know, know. Like, totally living the, the dream. Right. But it's, I, it's just not my reality. I've got a very small pantry. I don't see myself canning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like that Bonnie raspberry jam so much out of the store anyway. I just, I couldn't top it. <laughs> I couldn't top it. So. Well, and I think that's if you really, because like I said, I really like to eat it fresh. I do a little bit of canning with my tomatoes. I grow shallots and those keep for a while. I do grow garlic, but it's a, it is a seasonal thing um, because, you know, I travel and, and I do a lot of other things too. And so, um, I think, yeah, like you said, you're, you know, certain people are wired up different, you know, yeah. where they're more the ones that really like to preserve that big harvest and yes. stuff. Um, but, um, but then it's just really always exciting the next year to grow something new. Before we, uh, leave this whole topic of edibles, I want to know what else you're growing. What do you grow in your garden that's edible? And then, Do you have them mingled in with ornamentals or do you have designated edible areas? How do you have that whole thing set up and what are you growing? All right. Yep. I do keep at this point, I keep my edibles separate just because my soil is better for where my veggie gardens are. My, I have my other gardens, um, I have more native plants in there and so the soil can be a little rougher. I don't have, I don't need it to be so um, uh, nutrient rich. That's the only reason why I don't mix them. But like I said, this year I kind of backed off. So I'm growing several kinds of tomatoes, including um, some of the different cherry tomatoes. I'm growing the chef's orange and the chef's green. There's ones called Inca jewels some different uh, Roma tomatoes. You know, those are the ones that I'll use for my pasta sauces and things like that. I mean, I have a really cool cherry tomato that I'm growing in containers called Candyland, and you just kind of pick those up and um, just eat them as you go. So mm. I'm waiting for those because, you know, then I can snack while I'm doing my gardening. There that's, you go. that's the whole point of that. <laughs> well, we got to stay hydrated, right? You can yeah. stay hydrated mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing blueberries in containers. I grow, I have very clay soil. So I really wanted blueberries, but you really have to, you know, watch the acid and stuff in the soil, the acidic level in the soil. So I decided just to keep them in containers and starting to get a few of my blueberries. So that's really fun. Wait a minute. Um, Are I you going to overwinter them in the container? I am. I'm going to. I have um, a spot in the back of my garage that I'll put my blueberry containers there. I grow shrub roses in containers. I'll put my shrub roses there. I'll bring my rosemary and stuff into the house. And that's what uh, my next big garden project is to do an herb barn and container storage, you know, kind of like an herb shed, she shed kind of thing back there because I don't have a lot of space. Because it is really fun to grow things in container and then just overwinter them right in the containers. They, you know, they do, they do great. So um, I started my blueberries last year in containers. And then this year in the spring, I just moved them into bigger containers. So they'll stay in the containers that they're in now. And then do you water them? Because or you must have mm-hmm. a heated garage, right? Uh, not heated, insulated, but okay. not, but not heated. Yeah. And so you wait it- and yeah, you leave them outside until they go dormant. You know, until we get that that first dormancy, and then um, then you can bring them into the garage once everything is you know they're done, they've gone to sleep basically, um, and then you just bring them in the garage, and then as things warm up um, in the spring, then you bring them back out. Wow! And do you go into the garage and occasionally water them in the winter? I watched them this year, and the blueberry bushes, I I didn't water. No, and they were really just fine. I'm amazed. Yeah. I would have never yeah. thought to do that. Yeah, um, I think, but, but you know, there we had a different winter. We didn't have. I think it really depends on the winter. We didn't have a really dry. You know, some winters are really dry. Yes. Um, and so you know, I did, I did test them. 
but I think you have to be, you want to be really careful with how much, you know, water and stuff they get. So they were in a container and they, you know, obviously stayed moist enough. Now, as things, as they came out of their dormancy, then I definitely started watering them. Okay. Mm-hmm. And do you have your uh, containers in some type of drip system? I do not. I do enjoy watering in the morning. That's kind of one of my morning ritual things that I do. I have my coffee in one hand and I'll just go ahead and, and water all my containers in the morning. You mm-hmm. are the drip system. I am the drip system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've been really fortunate with that. We I do have like a big some big maple trees and things. And so if I leave for a couple of days, I'll really give them a a very thorough watering. And then I will move them more into the shade and come back in a couple of days and they've been fine. I really haven't had any problem with that. Wow. And you must have more than one blueberry, right? I have three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you're supposed to have more than than one. Right. 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 You have to, depending on the types that you have, there's certain, you have to make sure you have the right pollinator for your different types of blueberry. Now, I have a pink lemonade that they say is self-pollinating, but I'm not so sure that that's really working. All right, so I might have to get a different pollinator for that one. But the other two that work very well together is I have a blue crop and I have a jersey. And so they're they're doing very well together. I mm-hmm. just bought two uh, blueberry uh, bushes. I have no, I can't tell you what they are offhand. So I'm giving it a go this year, but it was a case of complete plant lust, just unchecked. <laughs> <laughs> So I have them. <laughs> I have them and I have not done anything with them other than keep them watered. And now I'm going, and where are you going to put those? I got no spot for them. So they they have to find a home and they will. Something will get sacrificed and then we'll put those in. Well, or you could just do them in containers. Or I could put them in <laughs> containers. <laughs> Touche, no, I understand. <laughs> I under, you know, the fruit, you know, having fruit in, in a backyard garden kind of does get to you because I started with these blueberries last year. And, you know, when I bought them, I just bought them in these little tiny, like, you know, I think I, I paid maybe seven or eight dollars. They're these tiny little containers that probably at Lowe's or something like that. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll just try these. Yeah. And you do really get hooked, you know, and they all three made it through the winter. So then this year I was at, um, I don't know, I was at another place. I saw the raspberries. I thought, well, you did you know, not. The blueberries were. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> so I bought two little oh, raspberry bushes. You're going one's there. a jewel and one's a brandy wine. <gasps> well, um, okay, but here's, okay, this is, you know, a, um, a, a gardening faux pas thing. So I put them in the ground and I put um, tags by them, okay? And then um, something happened. And the tags got removed, and oh. one of them died. So I have one raspberry out there, and I'm not sure which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Beth? I have done strawberries, and I've tried them in containers. I see all over the place, all over the place, where people are growing cro- growing strawberries successfully in these crazy kind of containers. And I think it's really cool. But mine really never did that great. So I moved mine into a raised bed, and now they're doing much better in my raised bed. Okay, so they're, really, they're confined, though. They are confined. Mm-hmm. In okay. fact, I had to put a little cage around them because I do have rabbits. I do have bunnies, and um, so I had to protect them. Or you could do what I do and grow them six feet off the ground. No. What do you <laughs> do? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to grow them. I've seen them like grown overhead. You know, people will put them in kind of gutters or baskets and they'll, have you seen that? And they grow them overhead and then they dangle down. Yeah. And I think that looks really, really cool, but I haven't been successful with that. So I, I would be willing to bet they've got a, a drip line going through there to make them Yeah, grow. they must. You know, yeah, you throw enough must. water at it, it'll, they'll do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> They'll do whatever you want. <laughs> See, I've been a little afraid. I I um I don't know what somebody told me about raspberries once, but it they sound really messy. 
And mm-hmm. I have a messy problem anyway. I have a very wild and woolly garden. And so when I heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, I cannot, I just cannot go there. I have to, I mean, I have a hard <laughs> enough time keeping the structure, you know, in place, but yeah. Yeah. I like those free farm gardens. My garden is free. You know, I have a whole area of the, the native plants and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with wild and woolly, but you know, you do have to be considerate to your neighbors and things like that. So I try to keep everything on my side of the property line. <laughs> yes. Well, mine, mine is on my side of the property line with the exception of probably my grapes. I have to get in there. I have to cut them because they're on the fence. And for the first time, I must have some type of fungus because I went out there tonight and I I was pruning them and Mm -hmm. uh, to get better airflow and just I I really vigorously pruned them. And they the grapes were like white and moldy looking. Oh, that's not good. That's got to be fungus. I was going to say, yeah, is that because we just have had so, did that just happen this week because of the humidity level just soared up? Uh, you know, I thought I saw it uh, about a month ago when I was pruning them again. I was pruning them mm-hmm. uh, earlier too. And yeah, so I don't know. That my other issue is I have a um, right in that same area. My my grapes are growing up and over an arbor. It's they're very pretty. So they're growing up on and over on one side, and then on the other side I have a John Cabot rose that's growing up, and they meet in the oh. middle. And then in with the rose, I have a couple different varieties of clematis. So that thing's always there's some color always on that with with um all these different climbers growing. But um, I made the mistake of putting a really cute little hanging birdhouse right in the arbor. It's kind of nestled in the rose. And I'll be darned if I don't have a bumblebee nest. I mean, a thriving, I've never seen a bumblebee nest. And I didn't realize it was in there. And two, no, two and a half weeks ago, I was going to prune my roses because it gets so out of control. You can't even pass through that arbor. That's how we get to the backyard. So I knew I had to go back there and prune. And I wasn't standing there more than a minute. And I kid you not, a bumblebee flew into my eye and stung oh, me on the island. Oh, oh, I am sorry. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. And I, I literally, I dropped my tools I grabbed my yeah. eye. I ran into the house. I'm like, kids, kids. I'm calling for Emma. I'm like, Benadryl, <laughs> you know, get me everything. Oh, and, are you allergic? Are you uh, allergic to me? Well, I'm not, but I figured I was so concerned because the pain was so intense on my yeah. eye that yeah. I thought, ooh, this could be really bad. And then um, within the hour, it looked like I'd been punched in the eye. Oh. And when Emma and I were reading about it, it said, it referred to the whatever the bee injects into you. It referred to it as yeah. ven- venom. Mm-hmm. So I was t- telling this to my husband. I'm like, <laughs> and the venom has now gone below my eye. And he's like, it's not venom. So he's, I'm trying to like milk it for all it's worth, it worth, and he's not falling for it. <laughs> he's telling you, just calm down. He's it's like, a bumblebee. He's like, you got a bee sting. You didn't have venom in your eye. <laughs> I'm like on on the medical sites. It was saying venom. <laughs> You're like it hurts. Yes. <laughs> I have venom around it my hurts. eye. <laughs> I want to be able to see. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that oh was the longest man! Time. So I've got to get. Wow. In, I've got to get in there. But I've got uh, I got fungus on my grapes, and I got. Oh. Yep, yep, it needs a little help, but you know, that just does happen. <laughs> I know, I have two William Bathens um, that oh. are climbing up um, uh, this really sturdy, sturdy trellis. You need a sturdy trellis for that, but I I love them. But boy, you do have to really keep, I have to keep on them. In fact, I need to get out there and you have to, I have to really suit up not for the bees, but for the thorns because they, oh. they're pretty they're pretty thorny, but I really do love them. And they just, you know, they're, when they bloom, it's just really gorgeous back there. So I have lavender in front of it. And, oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, my clematis are blooming now, too. So it's, it is a pretty, very pretty time in the garden right now, isn't it? Hmm? It is. Your clematis, you mean? <laughs> my clematis? <laughs> my, my what? <laughs> your clematis. <laughs> yeah, your clematis. 
Is that like my claim? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I was going to tell you, um, I asked Emma how to say coleus. Oh no, say... it is coleus. It's definitely coleus. I looked it up. It's totally coleus. <laughs> well, she said, she said, um, she, I said, how would the, how would Latin people say it? And she said they would say coal as in cold and then a as in a and then <laughs> and then us as in zeus so we should oh. be saying coleus oh so well then people go. will really look at you strangely <laughs> <laughs> let's do it babe. you and me okay they'll really just say what have you been drinking <laughs> and then when we tell people let's do it just that way okay so it's coal as in cold cool. a as in the fonzie a <laughs> And then, ooze. Ooh. <laughs> <As in Zeus. laughs> That's what we will do. We'll do that on the fling, don't you think? <laughs> I, think that, I think we should. We've got to work that in. We'll have to figure that out. <laughs> Oh, it's just criminal how much fun we have. Oh, I know. (laughs) Well, listen, I wanted to also ask, because we we had talked about this earlier, but shrubs. You you have shrubs in your your garden, so you're not just all edible or all ornamental. You've incorporated some shrubbery. What are some of your favorite shrubs in Zone 4B or whatever we are? Yep. I came to shrubs kind of later in my gardening um, uh, life, if you want to say that, because I just want to kind of, I want to be honest here. Initially, I kind of thought shrubs were like, uh, you know, why would you put a shrub in when you could put a beautiful flower in or you can put something in that you would eat? You know, that's what I thought first when I started gardening until I realized that, um, see, I live on Windy Lane and it is indeed (laughs) windy. Okay. And, um, uh, and really, um, in my back area, I'm really the only one growing back there. Although in the last couple of years, people have started putting in gardens. And so what would happen is <laughs> I'd put in this lovely holy flower and the gales would come <laughs> and my flower would just be flattened and I'd be like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Until I finally realized, you know, not only are shrubs pretty, but they really do have a very functional a functional purpose. And in my yard, they're just great wind guards, you know, and, um, they, they promote shade and all the, you know, beneficial insects come. And so, they, you know, it's not just that I like shrubs too. They're just really great. They, they're workhorses in my garden. So I have, I have nine barks back there, um, which I love because they grow tall and I, I get some privacy. I have uh, several types of hydrangeas back there. I love those. I don't you have my um, bathroom roses, but I also have some shrub roses back there. Uh, I have lilac. What do you like to do with your garden harvest? You're all when you're all done. You're bringing it in the house. Do you have some favorite recipes? Do you have some special thing you make with the family that the kids like? Yep. Um, one thing that I has gotten has gotten very popular is I take my um, spicy peppers and I dehydrate them. And then um, I'll just uh, uh, put them in the food processor so that, you know, they become um, more like a powder type of thing. And um, I'll put it all in, in little jars and I give it out to my, my college age kids. And um, so they, they and all their friends love the spicy pepper seasonings. And they, you know, because they're really into like the burritos and all the Mexican food and all that kinds of stuff. And so that's um, a really easy thing to do and um, just really popular around here. And I, what uh, type of pepper are you using? You know, I will just mix whatever um, spicy peppers are producing at the time. So it's always just a little bit different, you know, but I'll mis- mix like the jalapeno with the habanero and, you know, just really whatever is yeah, and, and then so it's just a little bit different, and it's really not something that they can get in the stores. And I don't know, that's really that's been really popular. And you so love these I'll, children. I do love these children. <laughs> you, send them, you send them a little bag of peppers, hot, hot, hot peppers. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, well, I have, you know, I, so I, um, do your kids not eat spicy food? No, we don't eat any, anything okay. spicy. I think we're too Scandinavian. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, we, well, we talk about, yeah, our Swedish blood, you know, how we, our, our spicy Swedish blood, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> Swedish spicy, yes. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. My, my kids, we, we eat a lot, a lot of that. So those go over really well. And then, so of course, then I'll make the salsa. Um, I make pesto like you do as well. Um, but like I said, most of it, I really, um, you know, we just eat as we go and uh, we do a lot of grilling and so a lot of what I'm into is more of the seasoning of things because I grow so many different herbs and things yeah. um, you know so it's like if you have just a, you know fish or, or chicken um, and you you know you just kind of play with it like I said I love a recipe especially during the the winter um, but in the summer it's more like well I you know kind of feeling like maybe we'll put a little tarragon in here and uh, dice up some shallots, uh, dice up, uh, you know, mince up some garlic, kind of throw it all together, uh, make a paste out of olive oil, and then we'll use that to season whatever grilled meat that we're going to make. Or maybe, like you said, we'll make a salad dressing out of that. Um, we like to make bruschetta a lot. Um you know, those types of things. Now, do you, uh, when it when it's just about... Uh you know, the end of the season, do you preserve your herbs in, in, in some way? Do you hang them? I do. do you microwave mm-hmm. them? What do you do with yours? I do. I, a lot of times I freeze them. That's my favorite way to preserve. I used to dry them, but it takes a long time. And honestly, sometimes I just feel like they're not as clean then, you know, because they're hanging up in, in your house. Um, and so a really easy way is just to mince them up very small um, measure maybe a tablespoon or two, put it in a little, if you have like ice cube trays, and then add some water to them so they, they turn out to be like cubes. Some of the, like your oregano and your thicker leaf type herbs, you can just lay on parchment paper on a cookie sheet and actually freeze them. And then you can just store them in a little container or a box right in your freezer. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, when you use them, then you're going to use them more like in a stew or a soup or something that you've cooked. Yeah. So because their texture is going to be very different than when you just harvest them right from your yes. garden. Mm-hmm. Here's something you can try, Beth. I, um, I discovered you can microwave your herbs and it mm-hmm. dries them like in... 30 seconds, something like that. And the first time I did it, I was like early and I was checking like every 15 seconds, but it really like, it's almost like an immediate drying that happens. Which ones have you dried that way? Uh, All of them. Mm. Yeah. So I did my sage that way for, um, uh, Thanksgiving. I knew I was going to use sage and rosemary Mm -hmm. Um, but this year was really fun because we did have that mild winter. Mm-hmm. And every year I throw a huge uh, Christmas party. And right before that party, this was December 17th, right in there, maybe the 23rd, I can't remember. But it was late. I went out on my deck where my kitchen garden is, and I was harvesting herbs that basically God freeze dried for me. You know, I didn't, I didn't take it all down. And I was like, oh, I'll do a little, you know, rosemary. I was snipping a bunch of stuff and I made a garnish bowl so that when people brought things, I could just quickly throw some herbs on the side and it looked really pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. It, really, nice. And it turned out so nice, but I just was like, oh my gosh, they were completely taken care of. Mother Nature did my preserving for me. That's awesome. Now, do you ever bring any of your herbs inside and continue to grow them? I don't. I was going to ask how you do that because uh, what I run into, I have I have south facing windows where I would normally bring them in, but mm-hmm. I don't. I think they don't do well without the airflow, do they? They do need airflow. I have south facing windows as well, but you can put them. Um, you know, like I, I, um, have kept my rosemary. I have the, I think I'm going on the, the third year now 
with my rosemary after bringing it in. I'll bring it in during the winter, and then I bring it back out um, in the summer. And I keep mine. Now, people have laughed at me, and they've said, how could that be? But I actually keep my rosemary near my patio doors. And then just as we're going in and out, we only really use it if we go out to grill or something like that. It seems like that gives it enough of a breath of fresh air that um, that it, that is just fine. Or if you put it on your, your windowsill, like right by your kitchen sink, and I don't know if you ever like just open up, like crack your window just a little bit in the winter because sometimes you just want fresh air in your house. Yep. That just, that seems to be enough. Um, and I've kept, now, you know, all herbs go through a dormant period, you know, like around the end of, well, like right after Christmas through January to mid-February. So they'll they'll really slow down anyways, but if you just make sure they don't totally dry out, um, you can keep them. And then about mid-February, they'll, they'll start growing again and they'll kick back in. So they get, they have maybe a two week period there where they're looking a little sad. Um, and you know, you can't, um, harvest as much from them during the winter as you would during the summer, just because they're not as producing as much. Um, but you can still keep a lot going. Your chives will keep going, your basil, uh, your basil will kind of keep going, but you know, then again, you can always plant the little micro basil that we talked about earlier, the, the microgreens. Yes. Um, and, um, but um, your chives will grow. You can bring your thyme in that way. Your rosemary, definitely, for sure. Um, I am going to try my tarragon this year to see if I can keep that going. So there's a lot. Um, I I am always one who goes for the fresh um, because I do think you lose a lot of flavor when you dry. But it is a good thing to dry. But I do like the fresh herbs, too. Yes. Well, there's just nothing better than having all that stuff at your disposal. And yeah. stepping out there and, and just kind of picking whatever you want to do with it. Yeah, that is really cool. Now, is your kitchen garden, what you said about that, it just kind of preserved it. Is it away from, um, like, strong gusts of winds? Is it a, a little protected area? Is you that know, why? it's on my deck. If you can believe this, it's on my deck. My deck is south-facing, okay. and it, there's drip line up there. So it's watered twice a day. So it gets a lot of water. It has great Ooh. drainage. Um, but when, you know, we shut everything off, I had things that had bolted. I had things that were, you know, just really <laughs> tall, kind of leggy. I mean, rosemary, that just doesn't, you know, that just gets thicker and thicker. And, mm-hmm. and, and so that's never an issue. And then when I wanted it, I would just go in and grab it and do like um, a little small, like a little... Uh, votive vase. I'd throw some oh, cool. rosemary in there. So, you know, a few little things, but, um, I love, love, love it. And I just that can't me it. up in the middle of the winter. Oh I my mean, gosh. Just yeah. Really, mm-hmm. That just made the winter. I mean, that made our, we had a short winter anyway, but when you're out getting herbs that look fantastic, I'll have to send you a picture of it. You won't believe this, this garnish bowl I put together. I just was like, wow, the dill had gone to seed. But it was so pretty, you know, the yellow flowers. Oh, yeah. I just clipped them. I put them in the garnish bowl. They looked beautiful on plates. Um, oh, you'll have to send me a picture oh. of that. That sounds, you'll post it on Facebook. Yeah, that it would was be, so pretty. It was yeah. just pretty. And then, you know, you, you have a cheese tray. You just throw a little bit of whatever on there. It's fin- yeah. olives. And oh, my gosh, we were so happy in that. That was <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You were doing that was it. You great. were really we figured it. it out. Well, uh, well, you know, one thing John loves, and I haven't made it yet, so you'll have to tell me if you've done it, but he loves to go to Chipotle and have their rice. Well, their rice is, I mean, how many cupfuls of cilantro do you think are in, you know, the oh, Chipotle know. rice, right? <laughs> and I'm going, wow, you like this. This is my picky child. But when we go to Chipotle, I have to get one of those pie tins. Gosh, here we are back on pie tins again. <laughs> But I have to get one of those big tins and I have to have them fill it. That's a side. He absolutely <laughs> loves it. And I keep telling myself, okay, I've just got to learn how to make this rice. They've got, you know, the recipes are online. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, he just goes crazy for that rice. So have you ever done a cilantro rice? Um, I have done a cilantro rice. But like I said, I have always used mine. You know, I'll just pop out a cube and uh, use my cilantro that way. Okay. Um, 
But um, I, my sponsor actually is ready to harvest, and so I think I'm going to try that. My, have you tried microwaving the cilantro? Because that's a really thin leaf. Does that yeah. still work? I think so. Hmm? You've got to Google this. Google um, microwaving herbs. I couldn't believe it. There's yeah. a ton out there about it. You know, for it's it's something you're a little skeptical of, you know, until you do it. Right. Right. Kind of like I read the same about preserving them in salt. Have you read about that? I haven't actually done that. No. Um, but you can um, fill up um, a jar, you know, I've you have like a smaller um, mason type jar, uh, candy type jar, and just fill it. I suppose you could use regular table salt. I think I would use kosher salt or something yes. that had a little bit more, you know, beef to it. And um, yeah, and you can um, put your herbs in that and just uh, um, just leave them in there and then use them as you need them. Now, I don't know if they, I mean, in that salt, supposedly you can just brush the salt right off and it doesn't you know, it doesn't adhere to the herb. So that's like the microwave thing. I've been like, really? I, w- I should try that. Um, so I might do that. I might do both of those this season. That we'll do like salted herbs. I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love It'd that. be really good in soups. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be good, wouldn't it? Now what I want to do, I have my lavender is growing like crazy this year. And um, so I started harvesting that and then... Um, uh, also collecting my rose petals, and then I have some essential oils. They have uh, lavender essential oils and things. So I want to make some little just uh, scented sachet type bags and things as gifts this year. Oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was uh, reading this great book about herbs, I don't have the title handy right now, but I, I loved this book. And um, it was telling about the meaning of the of the different herbs, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that rosemary is the herb for remembrance. Mm-hmm, so whenever mm-hmm. I have to send a funeral card or you know something like that, I will take a couple snips of rosemary and just put it in the in the card, and then I'll write right on there, "Rosemary is the herb for remembrance, thinking of you." And then um, this year, when I planted my rosemary, well, and then I wrote in the cards when I plant my rosemary this spring. I'll, you know, say a prayer for, you know, so-and-so. And so so this year, when I planted my rosemary, that's what I did. Right. Some of those meanings and the understandings of the plants, that there's more than, there's a lot more to it than just a pretty flower or an interesting leaf, you know, that, uh, and I've always thought that was so interesting how they would all, you know, flower speak, you know, yes. uh, we're, we're, we're struggling. I'm struggling with, you know, botanical, yeah. <laughs> speech. but you know, to be, um, proficient in the language of flowers, I, I have always thought that that was just so interesting. What a, what a very interesting way to communicate back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they did, they used to communicate with that. Well, yeah. as you know, I just interviewed Tara Nolan, uh, she's the mm-hmm. author of the Raised Bed Revolution, and I know that you yes, provided some pictures for her with your fantastic photography. So, oh, what what you. pictures did you give her? And um, oh. tell us about that. You had to obviously, you know, orchestrate a photo shoot. And what did you submit? And what made it into the book? Well, the whole thing started because I grow um, in the keyhole method. Do you know what the keyhole method is? Never heard of it. All right. The keyhole method um, actually is a drought tolerant gardening method. Um, It really got its start um, actually over in Africa. And um, it's a self composting, um, water minimizing type of way to grow. And it's really cool. I actually have a kit. I want it actually, but you can also make them out of stones and most of them are circular. Mine is actually square, but the way that I set it up, it's two feet tall. So it's kind of, it looks like a raised bed and you start with a layer of green material. So that would be, you know, like grass clippings. Um, and then I actually start with a layer of brown material. So that was like boxes and things and twigs. Um, and then you added your green and then another brown. And so then you build it all the way up to the top um, and then you put compost and it's supposed to start out soilless. You don't, you don't use soil. And then you can plant 
right in that. And you water and you feed it through what is called um, the keyhole. And in that keyhole, that's like a, a catch basin, and that's where you put your garden, your kitchen garden scraps. And then you water through that, and it retains the moisture. And then the kitchen scraps provide the nutrients for whatever you're growing in your bed. And so that's why she interviewed me. And so I grew tomatoes and peppers um, and some other different greens in mine. And it was just overflowing. I mean, I don't think my tomatoes have ever grown so prolifically. It was, there. I just had tomatoes everywhere. And um, so, yeah, so I went out there and I, I took some pictures of it. Um, it was it was really fun, you know, to get the to stand back and to get the overview of it, and then to continue to come in closer until you're actually right down to the the fruit of the tomato, and to take all the different shots of the story of building up the keyhole and how the whole thing puts together. So that's what the whole spread was about: just how we put it together, uh, what it was like about growing in it, uh, what I learned from growing in that method. So it was really fun. That is fascinating. Have you ever Mm -hmm. seen anyone else use it or how did you, I mean, did you get inspired just because you won this thing or? Yep. Yep. That's how I had never heard of one before. I had never heard of one. And so then after I got mine, then of course I started doing the research and there really wasn't a whole lot out there on it. So I started writing about it, and there are several posts on my website um, about it and how it, you know, how it assembled together, uh, what that was like, um, you know, what it was like to to grow in it. And then I actually, since it was, since it was a raised bed and it's all, um, you know, all the nutrients right in the soil and it's very healthy soil. Uh, What I did is I actually put the PVC tubing in it and made low tunnels and grew all the way through the end of November, um, greens and things, and then started again in February and grew greens and spinach and kale. And so I was able to use it to both, you know, to extend my growing season on both sides. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to link to that on the show notes because I don't know that a lot of people have seen that. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's that's what she talks about in her book. So it's in her book as well. But there's a lot more detail. Um, in fact, you know, there's a post just really about what I learned and you know what I might do different if I if I did it again. But now I have eggplant growing in it, and um, I have. Uh, different kinds of peppers again growing in it. I, I do really like the peppers. Wow. <laughs> so, and I smell. did grow. No, no, it doesn't smell. It doesn't okay. smell at all. And the one thing I did do, I did it last year, um, the, the little compartment that you put your kitchen scraps in. I was afraid I have a lot of birds and especially in the spring, I was afraid that they might go in and, and pull things back out. So I did put a little cap over that. I just cut out actually a piece of cardboard and just laid it over that just so so that I, you know, I didn't want any wildlife or anything, you know, getting into it. But it must be able to breathe on the sides then. Um, yeah, I mean, because it's done with slats and so there's a little bit of, of opening on the slats, but it's okay. all open at the top, oh, you know. Oh, okay, I see. If you see a picture of it, then you'd understand. You know, it'll make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's currently inspiring you in the garden? Um, The things that inspire me the most in my garden right now, actually, this year are my annuals. I haven't really been very excited about annuals for several years, and this year now, and maybe it's just the season that we're in, but I just uh, have really enjoyed all the different color. You know, I grow a lot of things to attract hummingbirds and the different pollinators. And so many of them are attracting hummingbirds. And so I just love that. I also love my roses in my containers. That's just something that's new for me this year. They're up a little bit higher. And so 
they're just the blooms and are just very, you know, they're right there at your level. And um, they're just very easy to move around my patio. And so it just really gives me a lot of flexibility decorating my patio type of thing. I really like that. And then I'm very excited that my hydrangeas will be blooming soon. I love hydrangea season. I love hydrangea season. Yeah, that's fantastic. (laughs) Well, here's two follow-up questions to that. One is, are you using shrub roses then for these containers? Mm -hmm. So are they like the knockouts or what what are you getting? Yep, I um, really enjoy the East Elegance roses. So my favorite Easy Elegance roses are the Little Mischiefs. And um, Music Box is another really great one. And then the two that I have in containers are called All the Rage. And um, they're just beautiful. They're a salmon to pink kind of color. Oh, pretty. And um, they're just filling out so nicely and just a continuous bloom. So that uh, I'm really enjoying them. And then follow up on your hydrangeas. Do you add acid? I have the, um, no, I say paniculatus. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I say paniculate. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't say that. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So those, <laughs> um, I just feed in the spring. Okay. Um, and, um, but what are you, you know, feeding them? What do you put in there? So I use, you know, I, I use a fertilizer specific to hydrangeas. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then do you ever get the bags of, um, coffee grounds from like Starbucks or car- caribou and throw them all over your hydrangea or your blueberry for that matter? I I do not. Um, I I used to do that and really kind of had a problem with it. And someone shared with me that a lot of times the coffee grounds straight like that are too strong for the roots and you can um, burn your roots. And so they encouraged me not to do that. So I do not do that anymore. Oh. Well, the practice is alive and well up here in Maple Grove. <laughs> so, don't you just love different gardeners? <laughs> well, this is it, right? These, this is probably a myth. So I'm doing it like in, in the, there's no point to it probably. And then you don't do it and it's probably harm. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. who knows who's right. But it's, um, right. I, well, number one, I love what after I spread an entire bag of coffee grounds around and it's right outside my door. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, I made a point of planting my hydrangea literally right in front of my porch. So when I get up and make coffee in the morning, I take my grounds and I walk out the front door and then I fling them right, <laughs> right into my garden. <laughs> Wherever they fall, that's where they go. And I figure, hey, happy day. And then and then Mike McGrath, uh, this this garden guy I listen to all the time that I like so much, um, he said his favorite compost. This is all he does is leaves and coffee grounds. But see, he mixes it because he mixes them with the leaves. Now, I put my coffee grounds in my keyhole with all of my other things, you know. So that's where my coffee grounds go. Um, but, uh, yeah, hey, if your hydrangeas are, are, you know, coffee lovers, I say go for it. They have great taste because, yes. like, there's nothing better in the morning than a cup of coffee. Oh. So. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they do. They really like it. So now my challenge this year is, uh, and of course, being on this garden tour, who can resist those blue hydrangea? I know. I know. So I have two of the um, bloom struck. um, Yes. Yep. So those are just beginning and um, they're getting off to a pretty good start. And I think those are going to do really well. They have that... um, cold weather tolerance, um, built into them. And, um, they're just minor, minor really starting. It always takes a couple of years for shrubs to get going here. Do you have that situation where you are? I mean, do your, do your shrubs flourish right away or does it take one or two years for them? Uh, It does take a little bit, but you know, uh, here's something don't do what I did, which is, um, (laughs) I get, um, I get very, uh, you know, toward the end of the summer or toward the end of the fall. Um, I just want to 
I, there are certain beds that I just want to completely clean off. And my front garden bed is one of those beds. I want it completely clean. I don't want any critters living up near my property. So I leave all the perimeter gardens. That's fine, you know, along the, the border of our property. But up against uh-huh. the house, I like to take it all right to the ground. And oh, okay. um, yeah, and so, uh, and when you come see my garden, you'll be like, are you kidding? You do this, but yes, I'm going to show you. But I literally take the lawnmower and I mow. <gasps> I, I'm not kidding. So here <laughs> I mow it and it's getting mulched. And that's the last step I do. And it's usually, you know, it's right before the snow comes. It's, and then, then, then I winterize my uh, lawnmower. You know, I let it run and run mm-hmm. and run. But I, so I made the mistake of I had just planted um, the really pretty pink hydrangea. Maybe they're bloom struck. I don't know, but they're pink. They're a really pretty pink, almost like a wine color. Mm-hmm. Oh, pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're really neat. And I had bought three of them. Well, I mowed them. I, I mowed them <laughs> to the ground. And I'll be darned, I got two of them back. I lost one. Oh, okay. But I got two of them right back. And so now it's no hold barred. I, if, they, if they can survive a mowing, um, <laughs> And they're welcome in the garden. I know. I know. I know. You can only do a few fussy things. And, yeah. and, you know, then they just really have to, you know, you just have to be able to take it. Well, and there's just something so like you're almost giddy. You know, you're just you're mowing down that garden and you're thinking, I don't have to do this by hand. And I don't know. It just feels very freeing to me. So. That is very cool. I mow it down. Very cool. <laughs> You're out of here. Yeah. We're done for the season. We're done for the season. I put a shade garden in under under my locust tree. And um, so it's all these hostas. And um, I put some Jacob ladder. And then I put some um, fountain grass and uh, on the perimeter. because so we've got a tether ball. Um, okay. Yeah. Remember those? Well, anyway, Mm -hmm. we have one. And so, um, I did the same thing there. I literally mowed the hostas right to the ground. (laughs) (laughs) That'll work. That'll work. No. And and so you don't leave that because like I have ladies mantle and things like that, but I will just kind of leave that. And then I more of the spring cleaner, you know, so you just really take all of that out and do you take it out like after the first frost or uh, when? Kind of when I feel like it toward the end, you know, I mean, if it's getting really, really cold and I just feel like, okay, I just got to be done. I'll just mow those two areas and then the rest I leave. So my lady's mantle gets left as well. Um, okay. But I just don't want anything, you know, I don't know, after you've had any type of pest or, you know, I once I discovered that mice love to live in the grass, the um, the tall grasses, you know, they love to make their home yes. in the bait. Mm-hmm. Once I figured that out, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm done with grass. I yeah. had <laughs> I had beautiful uh, miscanthus uh, silver feather. And, you know, I mean, it's six feet tall. And you've got to cut it down, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I would leave it up in the winter, and it was right in front of our dining room window, and I had uh, landscape lights, floodlights shining on it. So the tall uh, miscanthus would wave in the winter wind, and the shadows inside my house uh, in the great room, it was like the this grass was just flowing. It was beautiful. It was oh, absolutely beautiful. beautiful. But mm-hmm. then in the spring, I have to go out there. I'd wrap a big uh, thing of duct tape around all of it, trying to capture it all. And then I would take a, a handsaw and just start hacking at it because you want to get it out of there before the new growth, you know, comes right. up. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you can tape it all you want, but it's still going to blow everywhere. I mean, there's going to be pieces you miss. And, uh, and then there's just nothing quite like, um, finding all the baby mice nests as your Labrador oh. is right there by you gobbling them oh, up. Yeah. I mean, it was just disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that is it. This grass is going we are away. Done. Yeah, we're done. We are done. We so. are done. Oh, well <laughs> now what's funny. Okay. This is kind of funny is that I have, um, I've always just had like one rabbit. Okay. Just, just one rabbit. Um, and, uh, we kind of have this, 
you know, Elmer Fudd and uh, the rabbit kind of relationship, you yeah. know. And, um, but, you know, I, I've definitely grown, you know, kind of accustomed to and fond of this rabbit as the years have gone on. Well, now all of a sudden I have two rabbits. Okay. And two rabbits who are very chummy and two rabbits who keep like scampering off into my native garden and places where I can't see them. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Because wow, now that I have two rabbits, then I'm going to have like <laughs> five rabbits. Yes. Yes. <laughs> very, very quickly. And one rabbit is hard enough, but five rabbits, I won't have a garden left. The rabbit you know? family reunion <laughs> is at the Billstrom rest- residence <laughs> on Windy Lane. I love so it. that's, yeah, that's kind of the same thing. So I think this year, you know, I, a lot of times I will leave my native garden up to the birds, you know, and uh, just to have some interest and things like that. But after I saw that this year, I thought, oh, I think I'll be taking most of that down this year because I don't need things being too cozy. Yeah, you don't need that. <laughs> well, you know, it is so funny. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier, the things we'll tolerate, you know, what we, we what we don't tolerate yeah. as a new gardener. Uh-huh. And then what uh-huh. you kind of just grow to accept the, the longer you garden. I, when I first had a problem with rabbits, I was so beside myself. I called Phil and I said, ask me what we're having for supper. And he, <laughs> he's like, what? And I said, Haas and Pfeffer. <laughs> like, we have a rabbit problem. I'm so mad. And then, you know, you're doing all the sprays and all this and that. And um, right now my neighbor is a brand new gardener and they just drive her to just, I mean, she's, she's just going mad about these rabbits and she's covering and she's fencing off and she just can't stand it. And um, I, I just see them and I'm like, Oh, you know, and this winter we had such a mild winter. We do. Mm -hmm. We are so loaded with rabbits and fox this year. I just, it's. Yeah, I know. And they're so, I mean, it's just one of those things because they're so cute. I mean, they really are cute. And actually, if you've ever seen a little tiny bunny, I mean, they used to come out in sun on my, on the little stones, you know, and I just like, oh, they're so cute until about this time of year. And then you're like, okay, I'm done with the rabbits. Now we're done. Now we're done. (laughs) No, yeah. we're done with the rabbit. Well, and then, um, you know, the rabbit poo is those little pellets. That is just oh, basically and grass, and that's great fertilizer. Yeah, that's golden. One of my beds is just just great because of all the rabbit little pellets in it, you know, and you have 10 years of rabbit pellets, and, I mean, it is just great soil. Um, so, you know, that, that's a good thing. Like I said, and one rabbit really will will make enough for me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and now you apparently have a little family going there. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> denial, denial. I know. <laughs> I was going to say, has your neighbor tried uh, spreading malorganite out? Because that is a smell that the rabbits do not like. And it's kind of a temporary thing, but if she has something like I will put, I put malorganite around right before my tulips are going to bloom. And then the rabbits won't go and eat my tulips. Really? It's a temporary fix, but they do not like the smell of that. And deer doesn't like the smell of that either. Really? So so she can throw that, throw some of that down. Yeah. Now, is that the stuff that is human waste? It is. So I, you know, I guess people have, um, you know, different reactions to that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm having a reaction right now. Um, But, you know, I mean, it's just like, you know, we use different kinds of compost and and things like that. And, you know, it's it's safe, dried, and, you know, you put it down with gloves on and (laughs) <laughs> so you can't blame the rabbits for not liking it then? No, no, yeah. you know. Well, so. there you go. Those wily <laughs> rabbits, they've got it figured Those out. <laughs> they do. <laughs> well, so Beth, <laughs> what do you regard as your uh, central strength as a gardener? What are you good at in the garden? All right. Um, I like the design aesthetic. So I, I like texture and color. I love to play with that. I love to play with new flower combinations. I think that's probably why I like containers so much because um, you can switch them out, change them out both within the container and then move your containers all around. So I really like that. 
I also like um, adding the structure to small gardens, like um, vertical structures, trellises. I mean, I'm talking literally structure, uh, uh, trellises or, you know, different obelisks that you would um, grow on. We are putting in a um, barbecue porch and we'll be putting a pergola around that. Um, I have plans to put in a structure of an herb barn and shed. So I like to put those within the garden and then build the garden up around that. And also, I just enjoy the garden. I think that's a strength. I think it's a strength to enjoy gardening, like to sit down and actually enjoy your garden. Because a lot of times we're just working, working, working. But you know what? I can sit down with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just really go, wow, I'm just glad to be here today. Does that sound corny? Does that sound totally corny? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's corny. And here's why. I I had a woman ask me, uh, we were doing a kind of a mastermind call earlier this week, and she's a non-gardener. But one of her questions to me is, why do people stop gardening? Hmm. And I started thinking about it and I'm thinking, well, big trauma, right? That would pull you out of the garden probably. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also think it's exactly what you just said. If you're not enjoying it, if it's just too much, then you're done. And uh, I remember back in 2009, I was in my first garden tour and I killed myself, you know, to get this garden, you know, Mm -hmm. looking great. And all the joy was stripped out. I, I did not like it. I didn't step foot in my garden the whole rest of the year. This garden tour was in July and I was so burnt and so, so not happy with it that Mm -hmm. I didn't go in it a whole nother year. I mean, two Mm -hmm. years, a year and a half, it took me to recover from, from that experience and then just finally be able to even want to just go out there and do something. So, Mm -hmm. And I do get that. I used to be very hard on myself. And actually, um, my husband, my family would get a little frustrated with me because they'd be like, oh, it looks so good. And I'd say, yes, but, you know, yes. and it's always, yes, but I need to do this or I need to have this, or I, you know, and I, and somehow, and I don't, I can't really even trace why, but that just kind of changed. And I finally went, it's good now. This is, this is good now. Sit and you worked. And so now sit and just enjoy. I think really when the, you know, the color starts popping and all that, there is all the texture. Certainly there's always more I could do. And there are tons of people who have far more beautiful gardens than mine, really. I mean, my garden is really very simple. Um, but I think if you just take that sense of enjoyment and just really give yourself that few minutes. It does keep you going. You know, it does keep you into it because you're like, well, this is why we're doing all of that. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Now, what would you like to change about your garden? That's a terrible segue after saying, you know, we just got to find the joy. (laughs) But if you could change something, if you could wave your magic wand and and change something, what would what would that be? If I would give it if I would change something or if I would add something, I guess that's probably different. If I would change something, you always think maybe um, to have a, a bigger garden would be would be better. Or I think if I could change something, I might have put some other privacy shrubs in a place that, that I didn't. Probably, you know, little things like that. But there's definitely things I would love to add to my garden. Like I said, I'm kind of um, fixated on this um, herb barn that I that I want to put in and I want to get the barbecue porch, you know, finished, those types of things. Well, I tell you, if I could change one thing, I would never have planted creeping buttercup. Ugh. Oh, creeping buttercup. Wrong. Now that's not that's not like a primrose or anything, is it? Well, That's I don't. Which it, uh, I don't know. It's it is a it is, it's a thug. It's everywhere. Oh my gosh! And the when the woman that sold it to me, I love 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 her garden. She's never in her her garden without a pruner in her hand, and uh, she's meticulous. And her plants all have the perfect amount of space uh, around each individual plant. I mean, it's just. I just, oh, really? Oh, my gosh. I loved <laughs> this garden. This garden is like, it just makes your jaw drop. She does such a wonderful job. But um, you cannot give someone like me creeping buttercup because. 
<laughs> no, no, no. That was a very bad move. So if I could change anything, that I would go back in time and tell my my younger gardening self, stay away. Yeah. Well, the one thing that I did spend many years getting back out were my black-eyed Susans. Those were the ones that went crazy in my garden. Now, I know people, some people just really love them, but they just were everywhere. And um, they would get really diseased and stuff by the end of the season. And so I spent probably a good three seasons just really going after those and getting getting those out. So really? I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And once they were finally out, I was very happy. <laughs> wow. And mine all just died. And Really? Uh, yeah. And I have to go get more. Now, you also have a penchant for orchids. And I know this because I did look at your website. Yeah. So yeah. how did you get started doing that? And then what do you say to people like me who have not joined Team Orchid yet? Okay. My orchids, um, uh, I just recently started growing orchids. I've always loved orchids. I think they're just such an interesting plant. Um, they just grow in such different ways and there's so many types of them. And I think I really got interested in them because there's something that flowers in the winter. It's something to grow in the winter and you can grow them inside. Now, this was the first season that I actually started growing my own. And I would say start very simply. Just start with a simple orchid, one that you really like, do the research on it, and get to know that one orchid. And and pick one that you really, really like, and um, just start that way, and it's just like anything else. Maybe, maybe you'll just keep with that one orchid, or maybe you'll start to grow more. They actually do grow. Most of them grow better if you grow two or three types of orchids. Um, but there's lots of places to find out about them, especially, you know, in Minnesota, we have both, um, Como Park. There's a great, um, orchid show at, uh, Como Park Conservatory and Mm -hmm. then the Landscape Arboretum and does one. And so many, um, botanical gardens now do orchid shows during, during the winter, just for that reason to get people out and have them, see something growing, enjoy something that's growing during the winter season. So that for me is the best motivator at all because winters are long. And for gardeners, it's hard. It's hard to go that long without really growing something. And um, your orchids just give back to you. Whatever you give to them, they just give back to you. And do you have any secrets for keeping them alive or keeping them happy? Um, I learned that it's why the main thing to keeping them alive is water management, that don't overwater them and to really be, go ahead and do that, that test where you, you know, put your finger in and you test to see how wet they are and how dry they are. And that is, that's the biggest trick. And then um, also making sure that they get the right amount of light, whether it's direct flow light they need or more filter light. But if you can manage the light and the water, then you're golden. Well, I'm going to give it a go. I've been ripping out, I'm a magazine ripper and I've been ripping out these. Anytime I see an orchid and they, in all the home design catalogs, they always show them in a beautiful old urn, you know, two, three, you know, three in a pot with some moss over the top. It looks absolutely Mm -hmm. spectacular. I thought it would be Mm -hmm. a beautiful centerpiece. Mm-hmm. So I want to give it a try. So we'll see. That's what I did with mine. I just went um, to my local nursery and I did, but I bought one first and then I was like, okay, it looks lonely. So, <laughs> so then, <laughs> they do look lonely. They do. Yeah. Then, you know, you group them and I, um, I put them on my coffee table and the same thing made like just this nice arrangement out of them. Um, and yeah, that's where I am right now. And so they, they bloomed and then now they they haven't bloomed. And so one, I had one that rebloomed and I was very happy about that. I was very excited about that. And so now I'm hoping that they will rebloom. And if they do, 
then, you know, then I'm like, okay, this is really a good thing. And maybe I'll move on and, and pick up a couple of more. I love them when you see them and they're, they're also uh, in more of a natural environment too, when they'll like attach them to driftwood and, you know, they'll just kind of grow out of that wood. I would love to be able, someone told me when I was first starting, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, throw them up in a tree. And I'm like, what? oh. Would that be cool or what? I'm like, if I lived in a climate that I could throw my orchids up in a tree and they would grow? I I mean, wouldn't that just be amazing? I don't live in that kind of climate. I'd have to climb back up there in the fall and bring them back down. Well, first of all, mine would go up and then they would fall to the ground (laughs) with a thud. And then the flower part would have broken off. And then all I'd be left with would be some hair clips. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Uh, It's funny. But gardeners from different regions, you know, will think about it. I'm like, it never would have crossed my mind to throw them up in a tree. But in the South, that's they do. They, you know, if, it, if you're in a southern type of humid type climate, they can just, you know, they can just grow freely up in the trees. I'm like, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Well, we'll have to invite them up here like January 17th. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll take yeah, them out to one ours, of our trees. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, ours grow in beautiful urns with moss. <laughs> they yes. don't grow out yep. in trees. In these very dry homes in the winter. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I was going to tell you that there is a guy who lives in Plymouth. So that's kind of halfway. Well, it's really more toward me. But he lives in Plymouth, and he is an orchid grower. Oh, yeah. And he has mm-hmm. uh, this um, greenhouse. That's all he does is grow orchids. And if I get a chance to meet him and get in there, oh. I'm bringing you with. Oh, I'm coming. That would be great. I will clear my calendar because that would be that would be like one of the best field trips around, wouldn't it? Oh, and that, that's the greatest way I think to learn is just to listen to somebody who's very excited. I mean, there's the, the whole orchid culture is incredibly fascinating, and there's just so much to it you know, that everybody has something that they're just excited about. And just to sit there and listen um, would just be awesome. I bet I bet it'd be great. Yeah. And you like to photograph them, right? Yes. Yes. I would love to take pictures. And I bet he would love me to take pictures. You know, it's kind of like your children. Orchids are so funny. <laughs> I bet. I bet it is. are flowers. Yeah. You know, orchids are flowers that, that definitely need some time and care and understanding of. People put a lot of time and effort into that. And so, you know, they become very, you know, I guess, attached to them. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm going to give it a go and I'll see if I get attached to mine. Yeah, there you go. And I'll come and take a picture of it now. That would be great. Well, there you go. <laughs> now, um, what would make your recommended plant list for folks who have small spaces? Because you do have a small space. You do a lot of I container do. gardening. So you have, you know, you can sympathize with people that are in apartments or uh, condos, have small spaces, you know, homes mm-hmm. that you know, maybe have, you know, restrictions. They can't have a garden, that kind of a thing. Can you come up with like a top 10 list? And of course, this would be for people who live you know, in our kind of a climate. So yeah, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, that kind of a thing. Yeah, I can. And it would really depend on um, like what they had. So let's say if someone has a small space, but they're also interested in growing something directly from seed, Um, you know, we'll start there. I think some great picks would be our zinnias. Zinnias are great picks. Um, Calendulas are great picks. Um, I also love, um, they're more like corms, but um, gladiolas, um, those, you know, all of those are pretty much surefire. It's really hard to not get something back. I mean, when you plant something, you definitely want something to grow. And so if someone's starting out in a small space from seeds, that's really a great thing. If you want something, a vertical or a vine, I would recommend a clematis. I just think that they're beautiful and can easily put a trellis in, even in a container, and you could grow your clematis. I also like the shrub roses. I think we talked about those. Talked about hydrangeas. Little limelight is a great small space hydrangea. A great small space nine bark is Little Diablo. Those Mm. are always great. 
I also, one of my favorite front of the border flowers are the balloon flowers. Do you grow balloon flowers? Is that Campanula? Campanula are the bell flowers. Oh, the bell. They? That's right. Yeah, you're right. Those are you're the right. bell flowers. Yes. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Actually, I've always just called them balloon flowers. The botanical name. They're pink and purple. Purple. Or blue. Yep. Yeah. Mm hmm. I so. I grew them and they're kind of part shade, right? Mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mine, I didn't have good luck coming back. Oh, okay. I know they're perennial, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Okay. That, All right. that and pincushion, I can't get to come back in my yard. I don't know why. And brunera. Okay. Ugh, brunera. Yeah. I can't get um, the pincushion to come back either. So, um, but bloomflowers, they now they grow very well in my garden. Do you ever grow Hucara? Yes. I love that. Um, I have several different varieties. I like it because there's such a wide color choice. Um, you can from the coral to the uh, different variegated leaves. Um, I love it when they bloom. Um, the hummingbirds just love them. Even if you don't have a hummingbird feeder, if there's hummingbirds in the areas, if you have coral bells, they will probably come to them. So I just, mm. I really like that. And then I think every garden, whether it's big or small, needs some herbs. So I, my four that I would recommend are lavender, rosemary, basil, and a flowering thyme because, uh, you know, the flowering thyme can always be used as some type of ground cover. No, some people don't like the look. I've I've heard that, but for me, I kind of like that mossy English garden look, and it doesn't bother me if it kind of grows into my patio pavers because I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> it is pretty, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. I just think it gives it that nice, very um, kind of just lived-in garden look, and I like that. Yes, it's very grandmotherly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and then you walk on it, um, as long as you check first for bees, but, uh, I do walk on my time and then it smells just wonderful. Yeah. Now I'm also curious, what varieties of trees would you be recommending to people to consider growing? Because, you know, we just had that storm up here in Maple Grove yeah. and I'm trying to get people, I know it's called Maple Grove, but we really shouldn't just plant more maples because, right. <laughs> uh, you know, know. we're going to get wiped out if we have any type yeah. of, you know, maple disease. And, um, obviously with the ash issue, you know, there are just so many other trees that we could grow, like a Kentucky coffee tree. Are there trees that you like and that you would recommend to people to consider growing? Okay, my favorite tree are the cinnamon um, bark river river birches. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you seen there? It's like a it's a river birch and the, the, with the papery type of bark, but it's more of a cinnamon color. Hmm. They are beautiful, especially in the fall. Um, they work really nice in a smaller landscape. Um, we have, I have one in my yard, several of my neighbors have them and they just, I like them. I like a tree that has a lot of seasonal interest. And so that, that is one that, um, is pretty all year round with or without leaves. Um, I also like a lot of the more type, um, of, uh, like pillar fruit trees. We have, I have, a um, a pillar plum tree. It doesn't actually get plums on it, but um, the bark is a plum color, hmm. and um, I really like that. That's a smaller tree, um, and it's it's good for small spaces. And then, and I was sad when I heard you say that your arborvitaes, that they got um, damaged in the storm, um, because as far as uh, all, you know, um, an evergreen type tree, that's, that's one of my favorites, um, as long as you keep them in more of a protected area so they don't, you know, get that harsh wind. Yes. So those are my, those are my, my three tops. Now, what yeah. percentage of your life do you think is given over to gardening? Because you've got the garden itself. It. Yeah. Yeah. It's all your spare time, right? <laughs> Just yeah. like me yeah. when you're doing a blog and, and the photography, um, it's both a passion and a job, right? 
It really is. You know, it, it is. Um, I just think it's very, it's just like anything. Um, you know, now I also have my family time and all the other things that I do. But um, there are so many people that are just passionate about gardening that um, once someone, once if someone asks you what you do and I say, well, I'm in, you know, involved with that, the, the conversation just goes to that and um, people chime in. And so it is something that very much, you know, takes over your life in a very good way. So, yeah. <laughs> and blogging and being a garden blogger opens so many doors. What mm-hmm. events have you gone to or what experiences have you gotten to have uh, thanks to being a garden blogger? Um, I, especially in the last two years, I've had some really incredible experiences. I've done some of the different shows. I've been at the Chicago um, Flower Show. And um, as part of that, a group of us got together um, and did um, a social media event on Twitter all about gardening and um, growing, which was really fun. Met a lot of different people um, in the field and also just um, uh, hobby gardeners. And that was really fun. Um, you and I know we, we met at the Macy flower show. That was very fun. Yeah. Um, a great experience. Um, last year I went out to California to, uh, the vegetable trials oh. through the National Garden Bureau and, uh, AAS, the All American Selection. And there was a group of us, there's five bloggers who were selected and we toured, um, different uh, companies and breeding facilities and just it was just a fascinating experience to understand um, how our vegetables are grown, um, what they're being bred for, what we're looking for, how the whole industry operates. That probably, that was a trip of a lifetime just to meet so many different people and to hear what they're thinking of and what other gardeners want, uh, you know, other growers want. That was really, really fascinating. Um, We'll be going to the fling. Um, I've also done several learning type things. Um, I went to a really great conference called um, the Garden Bloggers Conference. So, um, and This year, in 2017, when I went, it was in Atlanta, Georgia, but in 2017, it'll actually be out in Los Angeles, and that's just a wonderful time to meet other garden writers and garden bloggers and uh, people who are interested in growing. So there's just so many different things. Botanical gardens, I can't even tell you the number of botanical gardens that I've been to. Now, you named your blog More Than Oregano. What's the significance of that name? Okay. Um, when I first started cooking, I was very limited in my spices. I used salt, pepper, and oregano. And I would really put oregano on everything. And I'm talking about the dried stuff that comes in the jar, nothing exciting. But then just like anything else, you realize that there's far more to life than just one spice. And so that's when cooking and gardening and everything really started to open up for me is when I realize that there's far more to life than just having one spice in a jar and uh, you can just really expand in so many different ways. And so that's why I named it more than oregano because that's really when things started opening up for me. Hmm, I love that. And then that allows you to go into things like photography because, hey, more Mm -hmm. than oregano. That's it. You could just keep growing. (laughs) It can be anything because it's more than just oregano. That's right. (laughs) It's always more. Not that there's anything wrong with oregano, though, because I, you know, I want to, I grow lots of oregano. I use oregano, still use oregano in a lot of things, but there's always more than just oregano. I love it. I love that story. That's great. I'm imagining you with your, your little McCormick jar of That's what it is. (laughs) <laughs> sprinkling it on everything, <laughs> pasta, chicken, whatever I had. Oh, let's add some oregano to that. <laughs> so um, who do you admire? Who do you follow? Who do you like that's uh, doing what we do? All righty. Well, I have to tell you, I was, I've been very, very fortunate um, to be, um, you know, influenced by, A lot of really wonderful people. I know Nikki Jabor, uh, Lisa Steele, 
and oh, and Tracy Blevins of Plants Map, Tanya Anderson of the Lovely Greens. There's just really a, a lot of people that I have followed and and have gotten to know. And then I also have this really great group of fellow bloggers that we've just kind of met on Twitter and we keep this rolling conversation going. And these ladies have just been wonderful. Um, Emily Murphy of Pass the Pistol, Bren Haas of uh, Creative Living and Growing, Angie, and I'm probably going to butcher her last name, but I believe she pronounces it liturgy, um, Angie the Freckled Rose, Jen McGinnis of Frau Zinni, and I'm uh, Shelly Cuevas of Gilded Gardener. Am I just, like, overwhelming you? No, no. <laughs> but um, Handy Helen is in there. Maggie Towson, she doesn't um, blog, but she uh, she tweets, and Allison Rowan also has a blog. And this is just a group of gals. We are all very different, variety of ages just a variety of perspectives on how we do things, but we just support one another and encourage one another and just spur each other on. And I would not, I would literally not be doing what I'm doing today and where I am today without these gals. I I, I absolutely would not be. So I just owe them so much and we've all become friends and we meet up at different events. I think Bren's going to be coming to the sling and uh, we keep hoping and trying to all get together at one of the different garden events that happen and we haven't actually pulled that off yet, but I hope sometime in the future we get to do that. Well, I think there is just an abundance of good people to get to know in this particular yeah. mm-hmm. field mm-hmm. for whatever reason. But I know even just uh, in gardening in real life in general, some of my best friends I've met in the garden um, stands to reason, I suppose, that if they decide to become a blogger, they'd be good too. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what's really great about this field and just even social media and all that we do, like just uh, you and I, I mean, this has <laughs> just been awesome, absolutely awesome. You know, we met at um, uh, an event, a, a flower show just this past winter, and I mean, I just feel like I know you in this conversation today, and I think gardening just brings people like that together, and it just brings out really good people. So. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, patient, if nothing else, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and tenacity, right? Oh, for sure. Well, and Beth, you are pretty active on social media. I see you on Twitter. I know you're on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're And you're very sincere. You're not a snarky oh. poster. So no. I enjoy your posts because I know what you say is what you mean. And the imagery is usually beautiful, the things that you're taking pictures of. So oh. talk to us a little bit about how you use uh, social media. Yeah, you're right. I love social media. I do. I have met so many wonderful people, as I was talking about the other bloggers that I follow, and uh, I've really been able to develop a community on over a variety of social media platforms. Uh, Twitter was my entry into the world of social media, and so I am pretty active there. I have the most followers there. I follow a lot of gardeners specifically. Um, We have some great garden-related conversations, Um, so that's fine. You can find me at Beth Bilstrom on Twitter. Um, The other social media that I absolutely love and I'm becoming more and more active on is Instagram. Uh, You can find me there at More Than Oregano, and that's just a great place. I almost uh, like micro blog, if you want to say, about my images. I post a lot of garden tips and uh, try to get people thinking, give them creative ideas. Um, So I love to connect with people. Um, If you connect with me on my social media after hearing me here, please let me know. Please say, I heard about you. I'm still growing. I love to know how people find me. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, an Instagram is the perfect format for your photography. It is. It is. And there's just really great people on Instagram. So I I just love Instagram. So let's chat really quickly before we close the show. I want to make sure we talk about some of the upcoming events that you have. Yes. Yes. We're going to do a grand opening of the More Than Oregano online photo gallery. 
It actually is up and running, but it's been a soft opening, and so we just want to really celebrate that. And for those people who have signed up for our newsletter, I'll be sending out information about discounts. Um, you know, there's some great uh, fall weddings coming up, our birthdays, um, even those people who are thinking way ahead of time for Christmas, uh, framed um, garden photographs are just uh, a beautiful way to have people continue the garden inspiration, no matter what the season is outside. And so I have several galleries that are available, uh, one that focuses on orchids, one that focuses more on the smaller spaces within your garden, um, pollinators, uh, different kind of more intimate looks of the garden. Um, and I'm going to be putting up a a new gallery that focuses on herbs, thinking more of things that people might want to display in their kitchen or kind of their eating area to uh, to decorate their homes that way. Um, but as I said, if those who are sign up for my newsletter, you'll get some um, additional discounts, some giveaways, and just hear about all the fun of that. So if you want to, you can hop all right over to my website and scroll down to the bottom, and all you have to do is leave your email, and you'll be signed up for my newsletter. It's very simple. Oh, that's fantastic. And you're going to give a special discount to Still Growing listeners as well. If you purchase something, there is a memo area when you check out. And if you put Still Growing in, you will get 10% off as well. Oh, that's perfect. That's great, Beth. That'll be wonderful. Well, uh, do you have anything else that you want to chat about before we close the show? Um, I just want to really say thank you to you. This has been just a wonderful time. I've had so much fun. It's been not only fun sharing with you, but I've learned a lot as well. And I think that's the best thing, right? Both oh, sharing and learning all at the same time. <laughs> absolutely. So it's really been awesome, Jennifer. I thank you so much for inviting me to be on Still Growing. Well, my pleasure, Beth. This was just too much fun. Seriously. <laughs> Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank my friend Beth Billstrom of More Than Oregano for being my guest. Please do check out her online boutique gallery of fine art prints by going to her website, morethanoregano.com, and then selecting gallery from the menu, and you'll be right there. You can see all of the gorgeous fine art prints that are available. Each one of these is individually printed and carefully put together and packaged. And Still Growing listeners will get a 10% discount by mentioning Still Growing in the memo area of the order. So take advantage of that. They'll make fine Christmas presents for the gardener in your life. Well, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, Ein Kadina, and David Gregerson for their help in putting the show together. And just a reminder that I'll have all the generous information that Beth shared on the show today in the show notes under the Still Growing Podcast page on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F T. M-A-M-A dot com. And if you really like the show, I'd like to invite you to join the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. It's a great place to ask questions, share your own garden stories, interact with the great guests featured on Still Growing, like Beth Billstrom, and also connect with other listeners of the show. And here's the secret. It's also where I post all of the really awesome promotions from my guests and sponsors, like the discount that Beth is offering today. So please go ahead and check it out. I'd love to meet you in the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Okay, we're going to back up. I've never done this before with you. I'm like, well, if I just keep laughing and laughing, she'll be like, come on, get serious. (laughs) (laughs) She did what? She she didn't need on that treat, and then she hopped right over it. (laughs) When you think of, you know, the things that you're good at as a gardener, what are your strengths? I'm sorry. I must really be getting tired. It's too late in the evening to go and grab that cup of coffee that uh <laughs> <laughs>
Well, okay. that's why we like each other so much, Beth. We're little <laughs> rebels. We're rebels. We're fun rebels. <laughs> yeah, we're fun. We're garden we're rebels. Fun. We're garden rebels. <laughs> I am ruined. I am ruined. I'm going to be laughing <laughs> you know, like a funny, mad woman. We don't even have any sangria or wine or anything. <laughs> yeah, this is us. This is pure garden mania. <laughs> <laughs> With that six foot mama and a regular woman. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. I'm going to just take a sip of water. Okay. Cleanse the palate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm like crying over here. I need a Kleenex. <laughs> I just got a Kleenex. I totally just got a Kleenex. Here okay. we go. Okay. Right. So, Beth, what do you regard as your uh, central strength as a gardener? What are you good at in the garden? All right. <laughs> 